this is 150,000. From this 150,000 potential users, in the last two years, we have th over 13,000 people that subscribe to our services. That would be about 3,000 and about another 10,000. So, this is our users currently using our platform. This is where 561 comes into place. It is the average monthly rate of subscriber that we acquired every month for the last 24 months. So that means it's going to take us 20 years to get from here to here. This is the 561 every month. So please help us shorten the next 20 years by sharing uh, the information that you find useful on our website. And if you don't like it, please give us feedback so we can get better. And this is going to end up the 561. And I'll, please give me one second to clear up the table. And in the meantime, I will tell you where I met the next speaker. That was about two years ago in Madrid. It was an OCLC conference. And that's where I uh, first saw Anna. And uh, she was speaking about uh, teenage education, basically extracurriculum education. And that was a very interesting topic for us because the idea was how do you get a message that you would like to, to transmit to an audience that you have nothing in common with it. And the channels that you need to use in order to still get your message to them. It was a very interesting presentation and I thought it would be very useful to have Anna here. Well, in the meantime, she shifted to different topics and uh, she is uh, working at the intersection of education, technology, technology and arts. She's self-employed and uh, she's in Yash right now. Anna Maurensberger. Thank you, Doreen. Thank you for the nice introductory words. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me here. Um, I'm very honored to speak here. It's uh, Doreen and I, when we met in Madrid, it was uh, a hall a little bit like this one. So every time we meet, it seems to be on uh, really in beautiful environments. And it's very fitting because actually what I'm speaking about today is environments, beautiful, maybe beautiful or not beautiful environments. I'm going to speak about virtual environments, virtual realities. Um, and I'm super glad to do so because I think there is nothing more, uh, nothing more beautiful than really being able to speak about the things that you are passionate about. And um, this is something that I'm super passionate about right now. There's not so much research in the field yet, but it's slowly starting to evolve, and that's why I want to share this with you. Before I start out, I would like to know a little, about, a little bit about you. We have the privilege to be an intimate circle. So um, just to know where you come from, or from Horizons, uh, who of you works as a teacher? Okay, a few hands, four hands. Who works as a librarian, maybe? A lot of librarians. Okay, a researcher. Uh -huh. Who of you has already tried out a virtual reality headset? One, two, three, four. Only the men. That is interesting. <laughs> you have? No, you haven't. Okay, so I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit more about virtual reality in a second. For now, I want to start out with you. So without changing your posture, I invite you to um, feel the way you are sitting here. Don't change your posture, just see how you are sitting here. How is your body presenting himself, itself? This is the only thing 
So I already see someone like, getting a little bit back in the chair. Okay, so just see how you're sitting here. Are you maybe hunching a little bit? Do you have your, I can sit too, do you have your, um, your legs crossed like this maybe? This is a very female way of sitting. Or are you taking a lot of space? Yeah, just realize this. How are you sitting? And now um, maybe just through a small movement do something to sit a little bit more comfortably in the chair. Do that now. So just, yeah, maybe some of you have crossed legs. Yeah, it's good. You are so few. I can really see uh, all of you. And we're going to see in a moment that body language conveys a lot. Yeah? Um, there's another little exercise I want to do with you. Look at me with serious faces. Most of you are already looking with serious faces. And then you go, you smile. Okay, and do that again, very consciously. Look at me with a serious face. And then you smile. Maybe you can, you realize that there is something happening. Did you realize that there's something happening? Who, did, who realized that there's something happening? Okay, a few hands. So actually, what happens when I do this, when I smile, my whole emotional background smiles, okay? So it's like giving a signal out to my cognition, to my emotional mind, to feel more positive, even if it's just this little movement. And I find this super interesting, and that's why, in fact, I'm not so much speaking about virtual reality, I'm going to speak about embodied experiences, about the body. So I like to speak about virtual reality because it's a fancy topic. Ever since I found it, or it found me, I get invited to conferences because it's fancy. But the reality is that the technology of the body is even more interesting to me than virtual reality. I look at virtual reality um, from an educational standpoint. So Doran has already introduced me. When we met um, two years ago, I was working in the field of online education. So I started out in Berlin, my career in uh, creative industries. I was working for a big production company. And uh, we were given a big amount of funding by a very big German foundation called the Robert Bosch Stiftung. And it was back in 2011, so in digital time count, that's ages ago. And they were giving us this funding um, with the aim to experiment with online education. Back then, nobody was doing that. And the aim was to find out by which means we could find um, strategies to get teenagers engaged in political issues. So we were super privileged, my team and I, we were really like doing trial and error and we created rap casting shows online and we were looking for the YouTube chancellor online and um, we did animational videos and we checked what would work and what wouldn't work. We were also accompanied by a university doing that, so there was a research um, uh, background to this whole project. And to me, the, um, the, the most important finding from that time um, is actually one that today sounds pretty banal, it's that relationship and experience matter in every sense. So in learning, context, relationship and experience matter. And for me back then, as I was working in online context, it was like, aha, uh -huh, okay. I thought it was about reaching uh, quantities of people, about reaching high numbers of people. But in the end, when I looked at our projects, the one that really worked out the best were the ones that involved relationship with each other, with us, with each other, with the users, with content and experience. So um, I found this when I was preparing for the speech and I really like this pyramid. I'm not going to go into the details, I drew it myself, so don't really focus on the uh, exactness of the levels, right? But what I like about this pyramid is that you see that the higher the level of abstraction, um, the more difficult the learning process, okay? So in the top we have the degree of abstraction which is high and in, in the, in the, um, on the foundation we have a low level of abstraction so it gets very concrete. And when we look at this we see that text, pictures, audio, even motion pictures are pretty abstract to the learner. They don't involve that many senses. Maybe they just involve the eyes. They involve cognition. And the more we get down, the more senses are involved and the deeper the learning process. I think for us as educators, also as librarians, because you have a, um, an educational, uh, um, how, how would I say, uh, Auftrag? 
this is my love sitting here, but uh, he's failing to help me. <laughs> so you have an educational, um, um, I don't know the word, but you were there also to educate people, right? Um, so when we look at this, the interesting finding is that really we forgot about the body. So till exhibits, we are doing the job as educators, and everything that comes afterwards, experience, 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 we tend to forget about it, and we don't integrate it into the learning processes. Why? Because it's pretty difficult. Um, so I was super inspired by this thought, and um, I took a sabbatical. I said I'm not going to work for the company anymore. I went to Chile. I um, studied with a very famous shaman and coach, um, and I studied um, a personal growth, which is nothing more than learning about yourself and about the world through relationship. To me, this is the definition of personal growth. So this is what I did nine months, and the body played a major role in uh, this educational understanding of the world. So this is the framework I learned. It's called ontological coaching. And I like this graphic because it shows very well what I'm going to lay out to you in the next uh, 30 minutes. So we have three channels of learning, or three areas in which and through which we learn. First, we have the cognition, which is linked to language. This is the area we all know. This is the area we all address as educators. But then we also have the area of emotions and the area of the body, which are areas that maybe in education we tended to put to the private because we were only addressing the mind. Yeah? But if you look at this uh, figure, it shows that these areas are really intimately intertwined with each other. So the one cannot function without the other. And it doesn't, actually does not function without the other. In the small experience we just made with the smiling, you see how this works. So the body is doing a small movement, giving out a cue, which is an emotional one, then later on maybe enabling you to do something that involves your cognition. And you can find multiple examples of this in yourself, when you observe yourself. So what I want to do is tell you two um, experiences that have been made by big Ivy League universities, we always have to cite the, um, the, the important people uh, to prove that something is really so. So the first experience I want to tell you about is an experience from Yale University, where actually what they did was to give an ice-cold cup of water to somebody and then introduce that somebody to a stranger. And what would happen is that uh, the people who were holding the cold water would interact with the stranger with a lot more mistrust. Um, they would rate them as someone being further away from them, more distant. And then they did the same experience with giving them a hot cup of coffee, and what happened was that the person would be introduced by the stranger and have a lot more trust towards this person. So isn't that amazing that just like, just the feeling, the temperature of the body can have an influence on how I react in the world later on. I think these findings are super important for us to take into consideration. The second, um, the second experience I like maybe even more, it's Amy Cuddy from Harvard University. And what she found out is that if you spend two minutes in a power position, so which can be like this, like the little boy does, or like this, this would be a power position, yeah, or uh, when you're sitting, this is a power position, okay, as opposed to an inferior position which would be like this, or also like this, or like this, so you get smaller, okay? So she found out that people in the power position, which is the Wonder Woman position, this is what she got famous for, if they spend only two minutes in this power position, actually um, on a physiological level, their levels of cortisol, which is the stress hormone, drops, and considerably by 15%, I think, whereas their level of testosterone, which is the dominance, uh, dominance hormone, uh, ra raises, um, I think it was like 20%, 20 to 15%. This is amazing what the body does. And also what she found out is that these people that were spending uh, uh, two minutes, just two minutes in a power position, were more likely to um, uh, get risks, like to take risks, and they took risks more frequently. So just imagine what it means. Like if you work as a teacher, you could do this with your students two minutes in the classroom and then see what happens when they take an exam, right? So um, 
what I want to come to is a, um, um, a quote from Guy Claxton, who is an embodied cognition expert. I like the term of embodied cognition because it means that it doesn't mean to get rid of cognition, it just means to include cognition and transcend it by using the body, right? So he says the body, the gut, the senses, the immune system, the lymphatic system are so instantaneously and com complicatedly interacting that you can't draw a line across the neck and say, above this line, it's smart, and below the line, it's menial. And then look at our classrooms. So what do you see here? You see, it's, very, uh, it's a very ugly term, you see hats on sticks. We don't really work with the body at all. You see a teacher in a power position, she's like this. Then you see people bend, uh, pupils bending, writing. You, d you don't see any eyes meeting. You don't see any interaction, no smiles. So this is a learning environment that's not very inspiring, right? And of course, this is an old picture and things have changed, but they haven't changed that much, if we are honest. So now we will have maybe these kind of situations, maybe we will even have a tool like a tablet, but still we are working a lot with our minds, all the time with our minds only. I don't want to get rid of minds, I just want to include the other uh, two areas of learning as well. So we are not smart and have bodies, we are smart because we have bodies. And for me, for me this in Chile was like an ah moment. It really meant a turn, I said wow, now I'm, just approaching education from a completely different standpoint. After this finding, I cannot do as I did before. So um, I employed myself. I didn't go back to, a co to the company. Um, and I started to experiment with embodied experience situations. So um, I created a body-based seminar, which is called um, Eight Weeks, Eight Freedoms. It's for adults, and um, it works with the body to enhance your inner freedom. It's a classical personal growth uh, seminar. Um, then through technology, I found uh, I found love. Uh, he's sitting there, and um, uh, what I learned from him is really how to love. I have to say, and together um, we started experimenting with teenagers and teenage educational settings with the body. So what you see here, he's going to speak about it later on, Anselm, at 11:45, and show you a little bit um, of our project as well. But what we did was really engaging the body in learning situations, and I must say. I think it works magic. And then, of course, virtual reality headsets crossed my way. So, what happened there? Um, virtual reality found me rather than I found it. I was at a conference and I put on a headset and tried it out and it immediately sucked me and I was like, whoa, what is this? So, the thing is, speaking about virtual reality doesn't really work that well because you have to try it, otherwise you won't really realize what I'm saying. I'm going to try to convey what it is about. So imagine you put on the goggles that you see here behind me and then you're not looking on at a screen like you're used to, but you are inside of the environment, which means that if you look around like this, yeah, or if you turn even, what you will see is a 360 degrees, 360 degrees of your environment. And the environment can be anything, from a documented reality, like someone filming actual uh, situations, so you will be on Times Square, or you will be in Syria in a refugee camp, or, or you will be uh, below uh, 1,000 meters in the deep sea, okay? Um, or it can be an animated uh, environment, whatever is possible, technically can be possible in the virtual reality. So you can be diving, you can be sensing, um, as a blind person, for example, this is nodes of blindness, an experience where you are in the skin of a blind person, or you can be balancing on a tiny piece of wood on the floor, uh, 1,000 feet above the ground in uh, New York, which is the, an experience that I did, and it really freaked me out. I put on this headset, and I was standing on a wooden thing that was actually in the floor. They lay out a wooden thing. So I knew, there were friends of mine, I knew that I, that I was not really on this tiny piece of wood. But at the moment that I started to balance on this wood, I really, my, like my whole body reacted to this. I got sweaty hands, I was shaking. So what does virtual reality do? It really fools our bodies into believing that what we are experiencing is real. And that is revolutionary. Yeah? I think that is really revolutionary because it goes so fast. You put it on and bam, you are there. 
Um, I'm going to show you an experience which of course is nothing like putting on the goggles yourself, but it will give you maybe a little hint on what it could be. Uh, Florian, maybe you can um, switch off the lights. And I need sound, please. There's no picture, so what shall I do? Do you know how to help me this time? Okay, so I take the opportunity while they are fixing this to explain that there is different um, ways of uh, producing VR content. So what you're going to see here now, you're going to see people wearing the goggles and having commanders in their hands. Just hit pause. Yeah, thanks. Um, they have commands in their hands, so what they can do is really interact with their environment. So you could paint, uh, you could maybe, um, uh, how do you say, shoot an arrow. Yeah, there's this game where you shoot arrows. You can do things with your hands and interact. You can even interact with each other in the virtual reality. Um, and then there are VR films where you put on the goggles and you cannot really do anything with your hands, but you're a spectator in, a, in another environment. What I'm going to show you now is really a proper experience. So I just have to hit. Okay. Just look at them. Look at their faces. This might seem banal and entertaining, but look, look, at, look how they are. Look at their faces. Look at how they are in awe. They're admiring, they're doing things. From my point of view, when I look at this, I can really see how they are discovering something about themselves that they didn't discover before, okay? So they're really interacting and what they're doing is highly creative. It's highly creative. They are uh, inventing an own world. This is what they're doing through VR. And they're having this trance music with it, which is very um, putting you into a present moment as well. So what they are doing actually is experiencing presence. Yeah, we can stop it. Mm -hmm. Okay, you go back to it. I'm <laughs> sorry about that. So uh, they're experiencing presence. What is presence? To me, presence is the moment when you forget that there is something else. That would be my way of describing presence. Are there any meditators here? Do you meditate maybe? Meditators, okay, yeah. Uh, there's many other ways to achieve presence, yeah. Um, uh, but actually what VR does, it brings you instantly into presence. And this is really interesting because presence seems to be what we need in order to address complex issues of our times. Presence um, trains the opposable mind. And the opposable mind is the ability of constructively facing the tension between opposing ideas. The ability of uh, constructively facing the tension between opposing ideas. We are living in a world that is very complex with a lot of ideas which are not so easy to address with our either or logic. And what we need is an opposable mind that can find creative solutions. So VR for this could be a very interesting tool. And um, it's not a coincidence if we have meditation, mindfulness seminars in Silicon Valley, in companies. Everybody is doing that now. It's a hype. Why? Because neuroscientists find out that, uh, found out that meditation really triggers your creativity and your, your, your um, opposable mind. So mystics have told us that for ages, and then came scientists, they all tell us, be present, experiment, stay curious, because it seems to be something very timely, something that we need, a quality that we need. Now, um, when it comes to VR research, there's already some good amount of research on VR, and very interesting is the Stanford uh, Human Interaction Lab. They do incredible amounts of research, and what they found out, for example, is that you can actively train empathy through VR by letting someone walk in the shoes of someone else, so you, you are put into the skin of someone else, and you get more empathetic, or that you can... Um, um, 
influence conservation behavior, like the use of paper or the use of water. So they did these experiences where people, after having a VR environment, where they were chopping a tree, for example, would use less paper than people who had read a text about chopping wood. Um, and they do many of these things. If you're interested in this, just check out the website because it's really, I, I find it very passionate what, they, what they're doing. And then there is other high rank organizations like, for example, the United Nations that started their own um, VR series and they use it to influence people with um, power and money. So they're not even screening these VR experiences that much online, but they're using it in their, um, in their high rank meetings. They put on and then people will have a better understanding of the realities of the people. So I'm going to show you a, a second experience. I hope it will work now. Do you have to come back maybe? I don't know. And this experience you will see is one um, where it's more about a documented reality that was filmed beforehand. And so you put on the goggles and you will be inside the world of a little girl living in a Syrian refugee camp. Um, I suppose this VR experience that I'm going to show you now is one of the best known experiences um, that exist right now. It's called uh, Clouds Over Sidra. And what you can do, I cannot show you now, but imagine just you had the goggles on and you could turn around and see everything. We had to download the film before and so I cannot even show you how that would look. If you look it up online, you will have a hand where you can look around on the video screen. Yeah? Right now you can only see this. So is there a sound? I think it starts now. My name is Sidra. I am 12 years old. I am in the fifth grade. I am from Syria in the Dara'a province in Khil City. I have lived here in the Zatari camp in Jordan for the last year and a half. I have a big family, three brothers. One is a baby. He cries a lot. I asked my father if I cried when I was a baby, and he says, I did not. I think I was a stronger baby than my brother. Okay, so I'm just going to cut off the volume. Um, so what happens here is that right now, of course, it just gives you a glimpse of what it would be if you put on goggles. It would be completely different because now, right now she's like stretched, you see this 360 degrees angle, it's, it's not really that. You put that on and she's sitting right here, okay? You have to imagine she's sitting, sitting right here and she's telling her, uh, you, her story. And, um, and it's very touching, really. So um, many times I have tried out VR experiences, I found myself crying in the end because it can be very, very intimate and very um, close. And I think what VR films mainly do is that they offer us other narratives. This is very interesting. Me coming from the field of creative industries, I'm very adept to the concept of narrative. And even if you look into political sciences and into how societies change and what they need for a change, you see that it's not so much uh, determined that they need, so the things that will happen and everything is going to go wrong, but what they need is narratives. So I think what VR can do is really let us experience different narratives without taking a big amount of risk, because it's just a virtual environment. So we can step into that virtual environment, experience it for ourselves, and step out again. And then we have another way of judgment. I think this is really, really, um, really, really interesting when it comes to VR. Ah, so we have to, yeah, we have to stop the movie again. Um, yeah, so the power of narratives. Of course, um, maybe you are already thinking about it, why I'm, I'm talking about it. Of course, there's a big downside to this. So it's a technology that is uh, coming. I think um, it's not so much a matter of if it is coming, but rather a matter of when is it coming. It is coming. This is why I'm speaking to you about it, because I think we should get started to know what it is. Some people speak about VR as the next big digital revolution, something like the internet, that it's really going to affect our lives and change the way we work, maybe even the way we learn. And um, 
from my point of view, I work a lot. I also work with libraries in Germany. Uh, in Germany, I work with teachers and so on. I think that very often educators are the last in the row to uh, to know what is technologically possible. Um, and I think that we should start seeing the options. Yeah, and um, we're going to speak about the dangers in a second. But I deliberately chose to tell you first about the potentials because when it comes to technology, especially in these old fields, old fields of labor um, like libraries, like teaching, very often I see this. It's like no. Yeah, people are very sceptic about technology, and then it's also a generational thing. So I, I chose to first lay out the potential um, before showing you the dangers. And the potential for me is that in the society that we live in today, uh, virtual reality could be a way of um, bringing us into another understanding. Why? Because we're living in a society that is facing fear, or that is moved by fear. Yeah? We have uh, climate change, we have crazy politicians in, in very important uh, positions, um, we have a lot of racism, um, we have so many challenges that we don't really know how to face, and a lot of societies are really moved or not moved by fear. So what I think VR can do is convey courage. As I said before, showing us other ways possible by bringing us back into our bodies, out of our minds, by bringing us into the present moment. And I think this is a super interesting tool, as well for libraries, maybe. Maybe for libraries it is even a, a super interesting tool to bring people into the libraries. It can be a new medium. Um, it's not that expensive. And um, yeah, I think that, uh, that we should start at least exploring it. Um, when we think of the, of the little drawing I showed you in the beginning from my ontological coaching framework, what VR really does is enable learning at the core. Yeah? So um, not, not all of VR, but a good VR experience could do that. It could integrate cognition, emotions, and the body in a way that we really, in the center, connect to something that I would call our souls. So now everybody can have a different understanding what a soul can be. I think a soul is something that you cannot grasp with words, so I'm not even going to try. But a soul for me is the ah moment. Ah, I understood something. I don't even know how I did, but I understood something. I uh, entitled my, my talk, the Discover the Soul of Science, Discover the Soul of Science, um, because I think that everything we need, we already have. So we have super good scientific research that we can base ourselves on. Um, we have narratives to tell. We have a technology that is developing in a fast pace. So all we have to do is find other ways of narrating all this. And this is what VR can do. It is a very good tool for discovery, for discovery, yeah? Taking away the cover from things. Because things are there and they are very beautiful. We just have to take away the cover. Okay. I already said VR is coming and we don't know how it is coming. I don't know how it is coming. I don't have a clue. What I did in Germany, I united some educators and we were speaking about the potentials and the dangers of VR. So we're kind of exploring the question, but we don't really know. And there are some potential dangers to it. The most important question being, who is going to control the switch? Who is owning the technology? As always, this is a very important question. Who is owning this technology? Facebook is already owning Oculus, which is one of the biggest VR uh, production companies. Um, Google is highly invested in the matter. Then, of course, we have governments. We have the marketeers, marketing companies. We have porn. We have all sorts of people very interested in the use of VR. And I think also this is a responsibility to us as educators, as librarians, as people of reason, as scientists, as researchers, to um, engage in this dialogue about what is good VR content, how are we going to ensure that VR is not used for the wrong purposes, how are we going to ensure that VR is properly accompanied if we work in educational settings, is it really okay to put on goggles and then bam, and then you take them off and nobody works with you after that. So I think there are a lot of questions that we can discuss as educators on how we want this VR revolution, if it's coming, how we want this to happen. So I think it's really important on conferences like this one that we speak about these topics. This is why I brought it to you. Um, then the good news is we don't have to wait for VR goggles to arrive in our hands. 
we can also say, OK, I don't have a VR goggle for now. I can start experiencing with the body. Because everything I told you doesn't have that much to do with VR only. It has to do with embodied experiences. So just imagine in your settings, whichever setting that may be, you would start to explore the body in your way, in the way that suits you as the educator in that sense. You would start to use the body with your students. And just see what happens. Just approach it with the scientific mind of trial and error. Just see what happens. I can promise you there's a lot of things that are going to happen. Ever since I use the body and my things, everything I do, stuff happens. Why? Because I give out control of my brain and I give it to the body. So what I would like to do um, for a closing session is to end this talk with silence. So I invite you to, if you want to, to shut down your, your visual sense, close your eyes, see what that does to you if you want to do that. Just shut down your visual sense. And it's pretty stunning what can happen when, once you shut down your visual sense. I'm going to stop talking in a minute. I want you to feel the togetherness in the room, the company of the other people next to you, and just see what it does. And if you can feel something else when you close your eyes, then you can when you have them open and look at me while I'm talking and presenting. If you let go of the wish to hold reality, and instead you let reality hold you, you are always in an appropriate place. Thank you. That was an interesting closure for a session. <laughs> so um, who wants to start to the question? Hey, um, Hi. excellent presentation, really. Um, and I think I loved it, especially because even though we've been through some of kind of the same experiences, I mean, not the shaman thing, but definitely the VR, uh, my conclusions were almost on the opposite side. Because mm -hmm. um, you started by talking about embodied experiences, and I think there's a general agreement that we are embodied spirits, as that's the term in philosophy mainly for this one. However, experiencing VR, it's kind of the, brings you the argument that we are exactly not that. I mean, the, the, the traditional distinction between mind and body mm -hmm. is at play, surprisingly, in VR. Because what happens, what is very weird when you fly over New York, as I also did myself, is after a few seconds of being confused, where is my body, where are my legs, how am I standing up here, what's going on, I'm going to die or I'm going to fall, after a few seconds, which is very little in terms of, of the mind, you get accustomed to actually not having a body, mm -hmm. of being merely a dot somewhere in a space that you can't even figure out what that is, and flying very bodiless through a, something that is probably just an illusion of your mind. So, but at the same time, I think while you're flying, you're going to experience something in your body. Sure, it's, in it's, your actual body, even if in the, yeah, yeah, in the yeah, virtual sure. reality you don't have a body because you're flying, you don't see sure, yourself, yeah. you're going to feel something in your body. It's going to be like, woo, I'm flying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but, but that, that feeling is still in your mind. So, that, that's, so this would be my, <laughs> my, my, my problem, let's say, would be with the word, because um, you had a chart that said, uh, the one that you discovered the soul in the, in the middle. So it was, it, mm -hmm. what was it, the first uh, uh, circle? Yes, yes, you mean this one. I'm going to because, switch to it. Yeah, because there is a... Yeah, let's go to... This yeah, one. Yeah, this one, mm -hmm. yeah. Because you, you make a distinction here between cognition and emotions, which is a valid distinction, but they are 
traditionally conceived together as being a mind. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, I don't think it's, nobody here would, 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 would argue that these need to be separated. Mm -hmm. I mean, the problem, as, as you described about kids staying in and being just minds, is actually not just they're just minds, it's because they're just cognition in, in your term here. Mm -hmm. So the problem indeed would be how to get their minds to be a connection of emotion and cognitions, because this is what we humans are. But I, I would argue that we're definitely not bodies, or if, if we're talking about bodies, they're just one of the vessels in which we can put our minds. Mm -hmm. And the VR is, an, is a fabulous example that we can basically move our mind to a different vessel, which is a VR space, a virtual reality, and we can live there just as fine. Yeah. Uh, and that's, for me, it was a, an immense shock. I, I, I had to think about it for, for weeks after that. What does that mean for us? Because I, was, I always thought uh, that we are kind of a, uh, this whole, this, this togetherness of mind and body, but apparently we are not. I mean, Descartes was right, and the whole 19th century and 20th century philosophy was wrong. Uh, in a way, in a way, mm -hmm. of course. Interesting. And, and Did you the, try it out yourself? Yeah, I, I suppose. Yes, yes, Otherwise, course, yeah, you yeah, wouldn't. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah okay. And it's, it's not only that. There is a, a second uh, experience, and I'll, I'll stop after this. Uh, I was in a, in a hospital, well, whatever, so I had a, a, a trouble with my hand. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at my hand, um, and I... It was a way in which it was pain or something, it's something with an allergy, right? And I was looking at my hand, and I, I had a distinct feeling that I am something that is looking at my hand. So I, I thought of my body at a, in that moment as a property, in a way. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of feeling sorry for my hands, so not for myself, but for yeah, my hand. Something yeah. was happening to it. So these kind of experiences, I think they are telling that there is an actual difference, this distance between mind and body. And we, we are just about, in a way, to overcome that by mm -hmm. being able to move our minds into different spaces. And VR is a fabulous example of that. Yeah. That would be my... Yeah, thank you. Very interesting contribution. I think, actually, that um, what may happen when we look more into VR environments uh, that we have to rethink our notion or our concept of the body. Because I wouldn't agree that our body is not in the experience. It's just not our body. And of course, you're right. Afterwards, it's the mind acting. But how do we get out of our brains by our bodies? So if you look at any mythical tradition and also at VR, what they all do is always using the body, as you say, as a vessel. If it's just sitting down and meditating and not moving, I'm not really doing anything with my body, but I use my body as a vessel to get out of my brain. And I think that VR does that in a kind of weak sense, because of course it takes away our, our real bodies, but it gives us a new one, which isn't there, which is virtual, but which has a response to what we are feeling. You see what I mean? And there's a lot of very interesting, very nerdy VR research on how, how we can apply the body in experiences. For example, I watched a talk, a woman that is really researching body motion. So she says that she's working on a project called Luna Project and it's, it's about uh, taking, it's like a, about taking something from, uh, from the universe. So it's about walking around and picking grapes like, and she wants it to be in a very light way. Yeah? She wants it to be like this. So her research is really how can I do this so it's not going to be like this, that I don't have the power grip, but that I have a precision grip where I can move like this. So this is, the body is, in VR research, it's a super important topic. They speak about the body a lot. How can we do this so that what it does to the mind will be this? And this is what I find interesting. So yeah, thank you for, the, for your remark. Do you find yourself in what I'm saying? I think we agree, actually, yeah, yeah. Anybody else has a question? I am curious about one thing. Yes, Dorin. The discovery thing. What's the age where you should give the kids the opportunity to discover like this so they can still grow up and make a clear difference and actually learn everything that you said without getting addicted and without wanting to stay in a world that is virtual? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, it's a good topic. I think there is not so much research on VR for kids, like the small ones uh, yet. So I cannot really respond to your question in terms of number, age. I don't know. Um, but from my point of view, it's just like with technology in general. I think what we need to do always is, um, no matter the age, is to 
teach ourselves first, maybe, and then others, um, how to use technology for the better and when to know when to stop. And I think for this, again, you will need presence and an opposable mind which tells you. So, you know, I think it, it, what we need is to train ourselves better in knowing what, what is good for us. So we will not fi f uh, fall into this trap of getting addicted because, yes, there's a lot of addictive potential in this. And, uh, and it might keep us from living the life we have to live in the real world. Yeah. Does this respond to your question yeah, yeah. a little bit? Uh, yeah. It does, it does. Thank you. One last question, if there is anybody. Well, if not, Anna, thank you very much. Thank you so very, much. Very thank you. Good morning. Bună dimineața. Uh, vom avea o sesiune bilingvă, română-engleză. Avem speaker care doresc să vorbească în engleză, avem speaker care doresc să aibă slai, au slide-urile în engleză și vorbesc în limba română. Deci urmează această sesiune, lăsați-mă să pun ochelarii, să-mi iau poziția corpului care trebuie, și să vă spun că urmează sesiunea Inovație în Educație și Literatura Științifică. Innovation in Education and Scientific Literature. Sunteți familiarizați cu acest lucru? Numele meu este Angela Repanovici, sunt de la Universitatea Transilvania din Brașov, o universitate minunată din centrul țării. Devizul nostru este învață să fii în centru și dacă doriți să învățați să fiți în centru, veniți la Universitatea Transilvania din Brașov. Mai departe avem trei uh, lectori, domnul dr. Alexandru Roja de la Universitatea de Vest Timișoara, domnul Paul Baloc de la, din UK, o să ne spună dumnealui, CEO, cofondator, Learn Forward, Marea Britanie, și doctor Valentin Ionuț Pantea, de la antrenor la echipa națională de robotică a României. Îl invit pentru prima prezentare pe domnul doctor Alexandru Roșa. O să îl prezint puțin din... Foarte pe scurt, da, spune domnul profesor. Este lector universitar în cadrul Facultății de Economie și de Administrare a Afacerilor din Timișoara. Are o activitate de cercetare conturată în domeniul managementului strategic și al economiei și transformării digitale și inovațiilor disruptive. Este dedicat dezvoltării ecosistemelor antrenoriale și tehnologice bazate pe inovare, transfer tehnologic și transformare digitală. Rog, Mulțumesc foarte mult. O să stau aici, cred că se aude mai bine un pic microfonul uh, acesta. Acum, uh, rolul meu este de a pune în context discuția de azi. Background-ul meu este mai mult economic și vin într-o zonă de management strategic în care încercăm să uh, ne dăm seama cam care sunt principalele tendințe în lume și pentru prezentarea de astăzi mi-a venit o idee de a o lega cu niște schimbări pe care le traversăm și pe care o să le traversăm, îmi permit să fac și un pic de anticipație azi și o să vedem ce se întâmplă în educație, mai spre finalul prezentării mele, plecând de la inovațiile disruptive. Și când vorbesc de inovații disruptive, aici mă gândesc în primul rând la Clayton Christensen, care a venit prima dată cu acest concept și vedem din ce în ce mai mult efectul acestor inovații care apar într-un domeniu, doar că simțim efectul lor și în alte domenii sau în alte sectoare de afaceri. Și aici nu e vorba doar de educație sau economie, ci aproape în orice domeniu pe care îl experimentăm. Și ce propune acest concept de inovații disruptive? Lucruri mai ieftine, mai simple, mai mici și uh, mult mai convenabile. Și aș vrea să particularizez un pic aici legat de inovațiile disruptive pentru că uh, cred eu 
că toate aceste lucruri vor avea un impact foarte mare asupra educației. Și când spun asta, nu e neapărat că am așa o temere, însă va schimba foarte mult modul în care noi ne vom face treaba și modul în care elevii și studenți învață. Și o să dăm câteva exemple puțin mai încolo. Înainte să ajungem la study case-uri, nu știu dacă ați auzit de compania Gartner, poate este cea mai bună companie din lume care face cercetări și analizează principalele trenduri care uh, au o influență și un impact asupra tuturor domeniilor din lume și ei fac predicții în fiecare an. Și compania Gartner, uh, e foarte nou acest grafic, a făcut câteva predicții pentru anul 2017 și uh, anul 2018 și dacă vreți, sinteza cea mai importantă este în acest grafic, Aici, în acest tabel, aici aveți trei trenduri principale, dacă vreți, și de la asta o să pornim discuția noastră. Și aici aș puncta câteva lucruri, mai precis, inteligența artificială și machine learning. În al, treilea, în, al trei, în al doilea rând ar fi realitatea augmentată și realitatea virtuală despre care ați auzit în prezentarea anterioară și platformele digitale. Cred că din ce în ce mai mult educația va deveni o platformă. Școala va deveni o platformă în care vom putea integra tot felul de instrumente în noi. Acum, ce se întâmplă și ce se va întâmpla în viitor? Care e principala tendință și la ce ar trebui să fim atenți atunci când uh, ne gândim și vedem produse care vin în mediul educațional, în mediul de afaceri uh, și transformă un proces pe care noi îl facem de atâta timp și cred că ar trebui să punctăm niște întrebări. Cum se schimbă procesul educațional? Care sunt schimbările majore? Pentru că dacă o să ne uităm și vorbim imediat despre uh, nativii digitali, au cu totul alt mindset și cred că toți uh, lucrăm cu acești nativi. Am început să lucrăm cu millennials prima dată și acum trecem la generația Z și vedem niște schimbări la care noi ar trebui să ne adaptăm. Ce se întâmplă și ce se va întâmpla? Toate produsele pe care noi le experimentăm, practic, se îmbunătățesc și derivă unele din altele. Practic, în momentul de față, dacă vorbim despre transformare digitală, ceea ce se întâmplă acum este, de fapt, o transformare permanentă a produselor, a serviciilor. Practic, când învățăm să lucrăm cu o aplicație sau cu un dispozitiv, practic, acesta se transformă uh, cu timpul și nu mai trebuie să învățăm neapărat lucruri fundamentale, ci această experiență să devine una naturală, intră în obișnuința noastră. O altă predicție care poate pentru unii este înfricoșătoare, însă cred că este un trend absolut natural, este aceea că tot ceea ce va fi electrificat va avea propria cogniție. Și când spun asta, mă refer la faptul că vom, va, vor fi dotate toate aceste micuțe lucruri pe care noi le vom avea în jur de propria inteligență artificială. Tot ceea ce vom experimenta, inclusiv procesul educațional, și asta e un punct important pe care aș vrea să-l punctez, este faptul că din ce în ce mai mult copiii, elevii, experimentează viața ca un flux. Dacă este să ne referim la un, o, o experiență de bază pe care o au ei zi de zi, de exemplu timeline-ul de pe Facebook da, sau acel wall, practic ei experimentează ceea ce găsesc acolo ca informații, ca un flux de informații, de experiențe și așa mai departe. Ei, acest flowing, dacă vreți, schimbă din ce în ce mai mult modul în care ei raționează și experimentează viața. Faptul că utilizăm din ce în ce mai mult servicii cloud și lucrurile se dematerializează e un fapt firesc. Aici, din ce în ce mai mult, companiile ca model de business tranzitează dinspre produse înspre servicii și probabil că și educația ar trebui să facă puțin același lucru, adică să se adapteze mai mult modului în care noi consumăm ceea ce consumăm. 2018 va fi un an de cotitură în care se pare că vom consuma mai mult din ceea ce nu deținem decât din ceea ce deținem. Și asta înseamnă o transformare destul de mare de paradigmă. Și aici vorbim despre sharing economy sau conceptul de economie digitală în care vom împărți ceea ce avem, resursele, faptul că din ce în ce mai mult vom avea nevoie de o filtrare a informațiilor, pentru că sunt, avem acces la foarte multe surse, chiar discutăm cu studenții uh, 
experimentez niște lucruri cu ei și văd că din ce în ce mai mult accesează o, o, o varietate foarte mare de informații în procesul lor de învățare. Numai că nu prea avem control asupra acestor lucruri și procesul de uh, transformare acestor informații în cunoștințe de multe ori este de multe ori este viciat din cauza faptului că nu există niște filtre. Iarăși aici vorbim despre interacțiune, ați văzut mediile, digi, mediile virtuale și o să mai discutăm și despre asta spre finalul prezentării. Aici am pregătit un slide în care cei de la OECD prezintă principalele abilități sau abilitățile cele mai importante pentru cele mai inovative joburi. Practic, dacă stăm să ne gândim acum ce se întâmplă în lume, majoritatea companiilor se orientează spre inovație. Chiar dacă sunt companii mari, își schimbă modelul de afaceri. Ce fel de uh, studenți pregătim noi? Ce fel de elevi pregătim noi? Care sunt abilitățile pe care încercăm să le definim în școală? Și dacă vă uitați pe cele patru domenii distincte, Există câteva aspecte importante acolo. De exemplu, poate cel mai important este să vină cu idei noi și cu soluții noi. Cât de mult încurajăm noi asta în școală, de exemplu, sau să învățăm să pună întrebări, chiar și dacă le pun în medii în care ei se simt mai comod, în mediile digitale nu neapărat la curs, sau... Um, abilități de a coordona diverse activități și uh, utilizarea tehnologiei. Sunt niște, niște lucruri care pe mine m-au pus puțin pe gânduri pentru că de multe ori parcă văd procesul educațional uh, sub, sub forma unei autostrăzi și noi mergem pe bandă întâi destul de încet și de multe ori copiii, studenții se duc pe cealaltă bandă și merg foarte rapid pentru că au alte instrumente cu care ei lucrează și deja mindset-ul lor, o să vedem imediat, este format cu totul diferit față de ce experimentăm noi. Dacă vă uitați aici pe acest slide, am încercat să pun principalele generații, hai să spunem așa, și o să discutăm un pic despre ele, și principalele uh, caracteristici ale generațiilor. Cred că toți am lucrat uh, sau avem copii sau uh, uh, avem prin preajmă generația millennials, care are un tipar foarte interesant. Uh, generația Millennial s-a terminat facultatea anul trecut, dacă e să punem așa un punct de hotar. Acum vorbim despre generația Z, care are cu totul alt, uh, alt tipar. Deja în companii, în mediul social, uh, generația care este dominantă este generația Millennials. Da? Există tot felul de denumiri, dacă doriți. Foarte mulți autori încearcă să definească mai bine generațiile astea. Don Tapscott, în cartea lui Digital Natives, îi numea nativ digitali, millennials, generația net, touch generation, thumb generation, app generation. Dar poate că cel mai important lucru care caracterizează aceste generații este faptul că mindset-ul lor, comportamentul lor și mai ales modul în care gândesc soluții la probleme este definit de acel framework social. Și asta e un aspect foarte important. Hai să vedem ce caracterizează generația asta a nativilor digitali, pentru că au niște caracteristici destul de interesante. Sunt foarte fluenți în ceea ce privește limbajul pe care îl experimentează zi de zi, cel al calculatorului sau al mediilor digitale. Always connected, faptul că ei văd în utilitatea de a se simți conectați, nu neapărat utilitatea de a accesa o informație, ci faptul că se simt mai comod știind că au acces la o comunitate. Și asta e un semn mare de întrebare, pentru că Uh, practic, ei de multe ori se rup de mediile lor sociale reale și caută să se simtă conectați în mediile virtuale, ceea ce nu e neapărat un lucru rău, însă dacă rămân doar acolo, ar putea fi. Uh, faptul că petrec din ce în ce mai mult timp în mediile digitale e o realitate, foarte ușor internalizează aceste medii și tehnologii. Pentru ei este, practic, definitoriu faptul că se adaptează foarte repede la orice. 
Și poate cel mai important lucru aici pe care l-aș putea puncta este faptul că ei nu au influenceri, ei sau schimbarea este aceea de afluență, adică se duc în acele comunități medii unde simt că pot împărtăși acele, aceleași valori. Practic, eu, dacă aș vrea să îmi fac o comunitate de nativi digitali, ar trebui să mă gândesc că nu influența mea ar, i-ar chema acolo, ci faptul că ei își doresc să vină acolo și definește altfel de experiență. Um, un alt aspect foarte interesant aici pe care deja companiile încep să le exploateze este faptul că acești nativi digitali își schimbă comportamentele și experimentează schimbări majore în viața lor odată la 5 ani, ceea ce este foarte rapid, adică ritmul în care schimbările le afectează viața socială, viața profesională, este unul mult mai mare decât al celorlalte generații. Și uh, un alt aspect important este cel al life hacking-ului, adică ei nu mai văd uh, procesul, ci scopul. Adică vreau să ajung undeva. Nu mai sunt interesat atât de mult de procesul pe care eu trebuie să-l fac, uh, pașii necesar ca să ajung acolo. Practic, sunt acele generații care vor să ajungă repede la rezultatul dorit. Nu mai au răbdare. Și acest fapt, oarecum, vine și din, uh, din uh, comportamentul lor în mediile digitale, dacă e să ne gândim logic, tot timpul când uh, cele 5-7 ore cât stau în mediile digitale, ce fac? Fie apasă, fie fac un tap, fie dau un click, răspunsul este imediat. Da? Răspunsul fiind imediat, în mintea lor, în creierul lor, ca acțiune, este reprezintă o gratificare. E, chestia asta ei o translatează și în viața reală, și în școală. Degeaba venim să le spunem că peste 3 ani o să obțină diploma, dacă nu le punem niște pași intermediari să se simtă gratificați. Acum nu știu dacă e bine sau nu, dar... Ideea este că ar trebui să ne calăm oarecum pe genul ăsta de comportamente și faptul că sunt early adopters pentru cei mai noi tehnologii nu mai este un secret. Hai să vedem ce se întâmplă cu impactul inteligenței artificiale, pentru că prezentarea mea are și atinge și această componentă. Lucrez de vreo câteva luni cu o echipă de studenți cu care dezvoltăm asistenți virtuali de inteligență artificială. Adică vom duce acești asistenți virtuali în procesul de învățare al copiilor. Și o să vedeți imediat de ce facem asta. Practic, procesul lor de învățare nu se mai rezumă la o carte. Petrecându-și foarte mult timp în mediile digitale, au nevoie acolo de un asistent care să le răspundă la întrebări, care să vină în întâmpinarea nevoilor lor și așa mai departe. Nu o să insist atât de mult asupra domenilor de inteligență artificială, însă am câteva aspecte legate de care va fi impactul inteligenței artificiale în educație, pentru că cu toții vom experimenta asta, dacă nu experimentăm deja asta. Practic, din ce în ce mai mulți studenți caută acele instrumente care le pot ușura munca. Vorbim despre life hacking, caută să ajungă rapid la rezultatul dorit și asta le schimbă foarte mult modul în care ei interacționează cu informația. Foarte interesant, de exemplu, pentru noi, ca profesori, am putea, utilizând aceste uh, sisteme de inteligență artificială sau dotate cu inteligență artificială, putem să înțelegem mai bine modul în care învață elevii. Vă povesteam că facem o aplicație și vedem ce, în ce fel copiii accesează informația, cum întreabă, ce întreabă, cum o folosesc, cum o internalizează, când și așa mai departe. Um, foarte interesant, e, sunt, e domeniul ăsta al inteligenței artificiale în educație, are și o, o, o sintagmă AI Education și uh, nu cred că va mai fi un domeniu care să nu fie afectat atât de mult de, de acest trend. Dacă vorbim și despre realitate virtuală și realitate augmentată, aici lucrurile stau poate și mai interesant, este o industrie care crește exponențial, vorbim de 200 de miliarde de dolari, bugete pe care multe companii o să le aloce pentru acest domeniu. Spuneam că 2017 este anul în care realitatea virtuală a devenit un 
hai să spunem, devin produse sau se concretizează în produse, dacă vă aduceți aminte de acel grafic de la Gartner. Și ați văzut exemplele mai devreme prezentate de colega noastră, în care, practic, îți permite să experimentezi procesul de învățare altfel. Practic, nu mai există timp, nu mai există spațiu, elevul sau studentul poate să experimenteze mult mai bine și aici există produse de realitate augmentată în care... Uh, nu sunt ochelarii de realitate virtuală, sunt niște dispozitive speciale în care ei învață prin intermediul unui dispozitiv cum să construiască anumite lucruri și această uh, imersiune în experiență de învățare poate fi foarte utilă pentru ei. Uh, dacă vreți, uh, realitatea augmentată și realitatea virtuală reprezintă 90% ca proces de simulare. Noi încercăm să facem trecerea de la teorie la practică. Poate că asta ar fi una din soluțiile pe care ar trebui să le adoptăm pe termen lung. Cum implicăm mai mult copiii în acest proces? Desigur, există foarte multe exemple, le-ați văzut mai devreme, nu o să insist asupra lor, însă există Hai să spunem diversi autori care uh, sintetizează foarte bine fenomenul uh, pe care noi, sau mă rog, trendurile pe care, la care noi ne vom adapta în curând. Și poate cea mai interesantă carte este ultima, care am prezentat-o în acest slide, Virtually Human. Uh, ce interesant aici este experiența pe care încearcă să o definească companiile, mai ales în domeniul educațional și uh, modul în care vom experimenta extinderea capacităților noastre cognitive cu, uh, hai să spunem, poate prea mult spus deocamdată, dar probabil că în 2029 nu va mai fi atât de exagerat, poate un, un, uh, un creier artificial la care noi vom avea acces tot timpul și informația va fi uh, accesibilă oricând. Acum, uh, desigur că discuțiile pot fi mai interesante pe subiectul acestuia, am vrut doar să trecem puțin în revistă care sunt tendințele, cred că ar trebui să fim foarte flexibili și să ne adaptăm și să privim tehnologia ca un instrument, pentru că din ce în ce mai mult tinerii încearcă să se îndepărteze de modul tradițional de a face școală și cred că noi ar trebui să-i aducem într-un loc în care să ne compatibilizăm viziunea noastră cu viziunea lor, cu modul în care experimentează viața. Pentru că în cea mai mare măsură comportamentul lor și creierul lor și modul în care experimentează viața este determinat în momentul de față de tehnologie. Mulțumesc și poate avem o sesiune de Q&A. Da. O să vă rog să luați loc aici, pentru că la sfârșit va fi o sesiune de întrebări pentru toți cei trei speaker. Urmează domnul Paul Baloc, este, dumnealui are un trecut academic în filozofie, s-a implicat uh, pentru aproape un deceniu în demersuri dedicate creierii unui mediu potrivit studiului și cercetărilor fenomenologice. Din 2005 a devenit antreprenor și a fondat Zeta Books, o editură academică și în urmă cu trei ani s-a mutat în Marea Britanie, unde a ajuns cofondatorul Learn Forward, un startup tehnologic și educațional care dezvoltă produse pentru piețele școlare, precum și pentru spațiul uh, învățământului superior. Ultimul produs lansat în 2017, Hipersei. Paul Baloc a realizat două produse tehnologice educaționale care au ajuns în sute de școli și mii de profesori și studenți din Europa și Marea Britanie. Poftiți, vă rog. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks for being here and especially thanks for inviting me. Um, I was told that I should speak English, so I'll do just that. The slides are also in English. But a good part is that I'm trying to do this a little bit more, uh, actually a little bit less just expository from my side, and I would like to kind of participate as much as you can. Um, um, by this I mean, first of all, uh, let's, because you all have smartphones, don't you, with you, at least, if not devices or laptops as you have. So can you just take them out? That's step one. Step two would be uh, close the Facebook, if possible. Um, and the step three would be to go on the internet and use go to a website that says, just a second, uh, go to hypersay.com. This is our tool. 
um, and add the code EN17. And I will know if you're doing that, because I will see here who's going to be connected to this presentation. So I have patience. Who's the first? Why? There you go. That's the first one. Um, as you will be connecting, none of, none of you will be required to log in. This is quite important, and I will explain later why this is one of the main things that teachers actually love about this product. Um, you don't, oh my god, good. Uh, see, one of the good things about this tool is that if you are switching away to Facebook or something, I will know, because this little red dot here will turn uh, another color, so I will know when you're kind of stepping away from the presentation, but uh, I'm trying not to be passive-aggressive, so I'll close it for now, but I tell you, teachers do keep this open, because it makes a lot of sense in the classroom for them to kind of keep an eye on who's paying attention or not. All right, so um, I will start with this image, which I hope some of you will remember. Uh, I'll take you to a short quiz, right? There's nothing in education without quizzes. And can you tell me what, this imi what that image was from? What, kind of, what, what was the movie? Oh, come on. You all know it. Oh, somebody said the class. Good. Two said the class. No. No, it's not the class. It's definitely Dead Poets Society, right? I'm, I'm glad that so many of you know about this movie because for me, in high school, in a Romanian high school, in the middle of the country, in Brasov, when we saw that movie, that kind of changed our lives as students. And it changed our lives in terms of we kind of took the destiny into our own hands, uh, we kicked one of the teachers out, and we finally managed to get our own um, teacher, uh, well, the equivalent of Mr. Keating, which was the teacher of Romanian uh, language and literature, to actually stand. She was a poor, she's kind of an old lady, very conservatively dressed, and we got her to stand herself on a desk because we didn't have a Mr. Keating. We kind of wanted to manufacture one, and it worked uh, magically in high school. Now, I think that this movie, combined with some of the greatest teachers that I, I, I managed to, to see, changed my life in a way that I stayed involved with education um, on. And so I, I kind of got back to this movie time and time again to understand what was it that Mr. Keating was doing so well that he got the attention of all those kids, right? So imagine the context. This is a very conservative uh, college in the UK, right? That's the, the, the idea about it. And it's, they are all boys, as kind of tends to happen. They, you know, still in the UK, you have schools for boys and schools for girls, which is pretty weird. Um, and we, we got to work with one of the schools that, that were probably the model for this movie, but they couldn't use the name, which is Eton College, right? Uh, so it, 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 it is connected with my presentation, and I think the, the movie meant a lot for us because it was a way to see a different world, but especially it was about Mr. Keating. So I tried on and on again to understand what was it that Mr. Keating was doing right. And Obviously, he was using teaching as intellectual seduction. He was not in the, in the habit of forcing the kids to learn po poems by heart, right? Uh, that would have probably never worked. But he was trying to kind of seduce them towards poetry. That was his goal there. Uh, and he was doing it in two ways. One was to capture the attention. He was putting on a show. He was standing on desks. He was taking them out for football. He was whispering things that probably induced existential crisis in some of them. So he was doing this kind of stuff that is totally non-poetic in a way, but in order to, to catch their attention to themselves, to, to himself in front of the classroom. And now that I think of it, I'm following your presentation, he was actually doing this a lot with his body, so you, you're definitely onto something there. Because uh, he was taking his body out of the normal position, which is behind the desk, boringly telling kids to behave, and taking it out and using his body and their bodies as well, when they were playing football, for instance, to convey meaning and to get them together. And this was, this was incredibly uh, useful. Uh, second thing is, the reversed image, uh, which is he was giving the students a voice, so, so he's kind of switching the, the roles, right? There is a, another scene in the movie, if you remember, when he is getting among the, the, the students, and then he gets the students to be in the front of the classroom and tell about their own experiences. So it's a, it's a very reversed way. It, we would probably say it's like handing a microphone to, to the students to be there in, in, in his place. So, very schematically, formally, if you want, these are the two things that Mr. Keating did in order to be successful in his classroom. And 
Probably, this is why oh, Captain My Captain was the 20th century master of student engagement. Uh, we would call it today student engagement. It's a big topic. Everybody's talking about it. How do you engage students and so on? It's quite a big, of, a big problem. Uh, it's listed as number one reason why in higher education students drop out. They are not engaged. They, they feel ignored in the classrooms, in the lecture halls. Uh, it is again a driver of, of uh, dropping school in, uh, in, prime, in, in secondary and especially in colleges. So it is a key issue today when we talk about engaging students. Um, well, things changed. I mean, uh, this guy, in the, he was, I say 20th century because he was in the 50s. I mean, he conveys the world of the 50s. Well, things changed massively, of course, and I I kind of semi-arbitrarily chosen uh, these two images. You know, these are from the um, selection of the pope, or how do you call that? Uh, election of the new pope, right? And that's 2005 and that's 2013. I mean, the, the difference is kind of obvious. And what happened in between is that in 2007, that little guy came out and basically changed the world. And it, it, it didn't change the world by itself, but it, it, was the, it was the first actual deeply personal computer, right? I mean, we've, having, we've been having personal computers for quite a few years now. Uh, laptops are also personal, but there's nothing as personal as a phone in, in this situation. And it's obviously no longer a phone, it's a personal computer. And, hello? It's on my computer, it's not there. Sorry, did I touch anything? Oh, it's back, it's back, fine, thanks. So I need to kind of, all right. Um, so technology changed, right? This is quite simply to explain. Technology did change. Um, and, but what does it mean actually for education? Because technology is something that today's teach, that today teachers are fighting, not embracing mainly. Uh, they are afraid of these walls of screens that may happen if students were allowed to use laptops. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a matter of fear, not a matter of, okay, this might help me. Um, and, but if you listen to the, to the students, and this is, this is a survey that we did after Eton College, the guys there, uh, have been using our technology for almost two years. We did a survey to see how things went. Was it okay, was it not okay? The, the survey was mainly about the software, of course, about the, if it works, how it works, what, what could be improved. But one of the guys there said something that blew my mind off, and that's this very simple observation, that typing is faster than writing. I know that for some of you, that may not be true in this room, uh, but for for the, your students will definitely be true. For them, typing on anything, a physical keyboard on a virtual keyboard, is a lot faster than actually painting letters on a paper. Uh, and that is, if you experience that, if you understand the deep truth of this phrase, uh, it will change the way you will look at technology as a means to help you actually get into the minds and lives of your students. What they mean by typing is faster than writing. They mean that when you type, you are closer to the speed of your own thought. That's, the, what's, that's what actually happens. And once you get used to that, you cannot really go back to paper unless you want to draw something, which is still easier on a paper. Um, this is, I think that, sorry. I think that if, simple, this, if this simple truth were, were, was to be, uh, would, be to, would be understood by publishers all over the world, uh, educational publishers, I think they would switch immediately to digital, but some, most of them actually don't really, don't deeply understand this, and this is why you see publishers coming up with PDFs, which are as non-interactive as possible, uh, or you see them using very complicated systems that kind of pushes everybody away. Um, we've been into this business for a few years now. We've built in Romania the, the first digital textbook. We built a sort of small learning management system that we ditched away because we saw that it didn't work with teachers. Uh, we went to the UK three years ago and we started developing other technologies around the same main concepts of how do you work in a classroom over uh, shared digital contact, uh, content. And we started working with publishers, but, and this is something that really changed us, we, real, we realized that the content that comes from a publisher is locked. It's locked there in the format in which the publisher wanted it to be locked, and teachers have nothing to say, not, nothing too much to say about it. When we asked teachers in the colleges that we're working with in the UK why they are not using existing digital content that comes from publishers, they simply said, I cannot take pieces out of it. 
If you are a teacher and you work with several uh, sources, textbooks, what you're doing is actually sometimes illegally copying bits and parts from all these uh, textbooks, combining them together and creating your own content, actually. Well, it's own in a way. Um, and you add your own stuff and your own questions and you think about how that class will perform. Does this exercise work for them or doesn't it? How do I catch their attention? This is your job as teachers, right? It's not just to take a textbook and switch to page 73 and read about uh, what's going on there, right? And teachers hated the content that they were getting because um, they couldn't do with the digital stuff the same thing that they were doing with the printed stuff, right? In the print, it's very easy to just copy a little bit and go on with it, not, uh, not the same with digital. Am I offline? This is interesting. Uh, okay, so this, that's, that was the moment when we, we realized that we should not uh, be concentrating on publishers that much. I mean, publishers are a business of um, uh, a separate business, and we still work with them, but we were much more interested in what teachers actually wanted. And they, what they wanted is to take their own existing content, something that they've been using and teaching for the past X years and improving, and take it in something that is finally collaborative. Because PowerPoints are one-way communication tools, right? I'm standing right here, that's a PowerPoint, I show it to you, that's the end of the story. But when you're teaching, you want them to also be in front of the classroom somehow. You want to get connected to them. And PowerPoint does not provide it by itself. So we build a system called Hypersync. Um, it is a system to turn your own PowerPoints, to upload a PowerPoint and, and add exercises on that, uh, and share the session with your students. They get connected with their whatever device they have, and you can be very digital, very quick, and very painless for you as a teacher. Um, it works like this. Upload a PowerPoint, add interactive quizzes. What do I mean by that? Let's add one. Um, this is a quiz. So, how are you today? It's not much of a quiz. Uh, good. Great. All right, and when I click Save, this quiz of mine is already into your phones because I pushed the content into your devices. So just scroll a little bit and you will find it here. I already have answers. See? So that's a very quick way. If you, while you're teaching, you realize, oh my god, maybe I should ask them whether they ever heard of that kind of a cell, or I don't know, whatever you're teaching, you can immediately push a, a quiz to everybody and collect their answers, and those answers will stay with you. And if your students are authenticated in the system, you can also do this, and you would know who said, somebody said it sucks. Okay, I'm glad you changed. Uh, <laughs> uh, so you would see immediately who that person was. Again, if you change your name, right? Uh, now, now you're all anonymous. And, and the modifications are in real time. So whenever you click on something, that goes there, right? Um, what else can we add? We can add a question. Uh, so what do you think about Brexit? <laughs> and no limit. So now, again, I pushed another exercise to all of your devices, and you, if you start typing, I will be able to see what you are typing as you are doing it, hopefully. Is anybody typing? Good. Bloody hell. Bloody bastard. Good. That's not how you spell bastard, but that's okay. <laughs> so what happens here is that I'm capturing all your answers, all your keystrokes while you're typing them, right? And this, in, in some scenarios, this can work wonderfully. In, in Eton, this is used something like this. Uh, whenever they ask a question like this, an open question, uh, they turn off the big screen because they don't want to, to have the other students influenced by what they're seeing on the screen, but they are providing oral feedback. They tell them, John, that's not, a, that's not quite a good answer, or X, that's, that, that's very good, go on with that, uh, explore that argument. And when they're done, they turn the screen back on and they see all the answers and somebody loves the British weather, <laughs> good for you. Uh, and then you can, that now let's talk about this statement, which is obviously false. Um, all right. Uh, again, you can add other things such as videos, and I push it immediately to you, or images, or just text if you need to add more concepts, things that you could not cram into the slide, and you never should, by the way. Um, good. Moving on. Three minutes. 
Oh my God. All right, who's using HyperSafe? These guys, all right? Uh, we've just get, we, we got started six months ago. Um, and we have now, we are across, we are, HyperSafe is used across 44 countries. Um, and we have some, some, something like 6,000 teachers uh, and lecturers, and so we, both school and higher education level that are using this on a daily basis. Um, I would like to finish with three uh, major lessons that we acquired while building this kind of software for publishers and for schools. One is, and I cannot, uh, I cannot understate this one, so always allow cust uh, content customization. I mean, I know that publishers don't necessarily want it because of, of copyright or something, but if you have, if you want to take your content and you want teachers to use them digitally, allow the teachers to modify the content or else. The second is simplify the control of digital classrooms. I mean, one of the biggest missteps in, in, ed, in ed tech, in education technology, has been the invention of learning management systems. I mean, they're systems, but they're not so much about learning. And if you intend to use them in the classrooms, then you are, it's gonna be, uh, you're gonna have a hard time because the systems are too complicated for teachers to understand or to use on a daily basis or to control. But if you have something like this, and you simply open a panel and you see who's Who's paying attention? Quite a lot of you. Some, some of you switched away, fine. Some of you went on offline, that's good as well. Um, so I, I, I can have a very quick idea of what's going on. Are they paying attention or not? And I see that 15 are, three are not, uh, so I'm on a good path here. Uh, and I'm also getting hearts, by the way. So if you, if you like slides, you can send hearts, uh, which is uh, one, of the most over, uh, one of the most abused uh, features of our system. Finally, give students, give every student a, vo a voice. This is, again, something that you cannot normally do in a classroom. If you teach to 30 students, you will not be able to hear what each of them are saying. Sometimes you go through a whole year and you don't know what that guy over there ever thought, uh, because he doesn't speak up, he's shy. Um, so, but if you use technology, you immediately have access to every single person in your audience, and you can pick their minds and you can get all the answers to you and we can review them later and get back to them. So that's a very quick way and technology helps you do that. Four use cases, everyday learning. So if you, if you think of using HyperSay and you're a teacher or lecturer, you can use it immediately. It's free for everybody. Um, you can use it for research, especially for data collection and communicating results. If you, if you are familiar with what Jupyter is for exact sciences, uh, this is something that you can use also, but more in the human sciences, more in social sciences. Uh, University of Catalonia is, is the one that actually came up with this use case. We never thought of that, but they started using it uh, in, in their research to do, to do qualitative um, assessments and to bring back data from, from people on, online. And the third one is obviously for conferences and trainings, and it avoids the, something that's called death by PowerPoint, right? It's one of the big problems, and it helps, helps everybody, I think. Uh, it's very good for audience engagement, obviously, and for participation assessment and for feedback. And coming to feedback, please, if you are interested in getting an invite to HyperSay or more information about it or staying in touch, leave your email in the comment here, and you can also give feedback. And this is, by the way, uh, this is built in. So as teachers, you will, be, you will always give, receive feedback at the end of your sessions. And the feedback is anonymous, so. All right, uh, thank you, that's about it. Thank you very much. Please have a seat here. Al treilea lector este domnul Valentin Ionuț Panea. Um, dumnealui predă finanțe la Se București. În timpul liber se bucură să lucreze cu licenii. Este antrenor în domeniul competițiilor de robotică. Este la curent cu noile informații din tehnologie. Promovează România prin viitoarele generații. A reușit să conducă echipa Autovortex către victorie la toate marile competiții de robotică din lume. Au fost calificați de șase ori consecutiv la campionatul internațional de robotică din Statele Unite. A jucat finala doi ani la rând împotriva echipelor americane. În perioada 2016-2017, împreună cu partenerii noștri, a condus echipa de robotică în România, a făcut-o accesibilă și la nivel național pentru liceeni în români. A creat 54 de noi echipe românești și a îndrumat peste 500 de elevi din întreaga țară. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me today to Iași. 
I will um, talk to you a little bit about robotics, what we do in our team, why we are the Romanian national robotics team, and what tools did we use to innovate some of the aspects in order to work with the students, with the high school students, much better. Our team is mostly uh, dedicated to First Tech Challenge. First Tech Challenge, it's an American competition. It is designed for high school students. And although you might think it's just robotics, boring, technology, nerds, and stuff like that, it's totally different. It's much more than robots. Actually, the robot is the tricky part that engages the students to create something differently, really to use and to work as a team. Otherwise, you cannot finish the project. But most interesting, because you need to create a robot, create a team, and fight in different championships, you actually get a touch of life and of real-time competition. There, um, there are several segments, because the Americans designed the competition starting with the smaller children that also want to do robotics, but they're not allowed to do cuttings or all kind of hard, uh, hard stuff. They just play with Legos. You see here the pylons. Starting with the green ones, they start from small classes and then they continue to the red one. So when they are eighth graders, they still play with Lego, but not just simple Legos. They do all kinds of automations related to sensors and also programming. Then comes the, um, the orange one, the one that we are involved in, First Tech Challenge. Here you can see it's mostly dedicated to high school students, but also there is another element, the blue one. Uh, over there you can build much more complicated robots, usually military style, you do welding and all kind of different stuff. What you need actually to do? First of all, when you, when you start a team, a robotics team, and you would like to compete in this kind of um, competition, you first need to design a robot. Imagine children starting with the ninth graders. They learn how to use different software, starting with SolidWorks or PTC Creo. Starting with this year, we also have virtual reality embedded. The robot has to, let's say, decipher some kind of patterns. Um, then you need to build a robot. Here in the picture you can see two of our robots. They are quite big. They fit in an 18-inch cube, but then they can expand. And what's very interesting, they are programmed in Java. Uh, here we have a big problem because the students in Romania don't learn Java in high school. They usually do C++. Although the syntax is quite the same, it's a different approach. Each robot has a phone. We use Android phones. The robot has a phone. The battle station has the second phone. Here you see this syntax, the hardest fun you'll ever have. Why fun? Because when you are a child and you try to do creative stuff, but then you see the finished product, and after you win a competition, things change differently. Um, each team can be mentored by an adult. This can be a parent, a teacher, or any person that would like just to, to give a hand and to help. And most interesting to develop these STEM skills that everybody is talking about lately. After you do all these preparations, you compete at a regional, regional competition. We had a huge problem in Romania because we had no local competition. And imagine it was super hard to travel all around the world, mostly in exotic places, starting with Korea and ending to Australia, because we had nothing in Europe. Uh, the guys from first, from the competition, made a study, and uh, the numbers are astonishing. A lot of the children that do robotics during their high school period are most likely to encourage a STEM career. That's interesting because in Romania, a lot of children, they just go away when they hear about mathematics, physics, and all the boring stuff that they do at school. With this kind of, uh, of a structure and a project, they see that their creation actually can move. It has a life. And they just receive courage to continue in this field and not to try to pick something much easier for them. Um, I have here a video about uh, our team. I will talk while the video is running. Um, hopefully it works. OK. Uh, you will see some pictures uh, during our history. We started six years ago. We, are a, we were a very small team uh, in a city near Bucharest. 
uh, in Voluntar. This is the place where I come from. And uh, six years ago, the guys from the American school in Bucharest, they tried an experiment. They had uh, this competition running for their American schools um, in the Eastern European um, part of, um, of the world. And they tried that year to bring two new local teams into the competition. One of the teams were, uh, was from, a, from the high school in Voluntar. It was a technological high school. And I was, the coach, I was the coach of the children at that time. Imagine I'm an economist. I, have, I had no clue how to build a robot, how to program, or actually how to manage a small group of children. But I liked actually working with students and with children. Uh, it was a success. We won the competition. Then we went to, to America, to the World Championship. We got beat up very badly. And then we, we had a choice. We had to choose between just going to the competition, just traveling, and that's it, or trying to, to build more. We, we chose the red pill to build more. Uh, I think it was a wise decision. And after six continuous years participating in the World Championship, we were the first team ever to challenge the American teams in the finals of the competition. Unfortunately, we lost the finals. It was a very stressful game. But I think this year we'll, we'll, we'll try to, to do much better. The competition is very interesting, and as I said, besides doing uh, all the stuff about building the robot, you actually need to be very creative in order to work with the students. Uh, imagine there are high school students, there are a lot of attractions and distractions, and you need to try to focus them first to finish the robot, to be attentive, and we try to do the educational part of actually programming and learning how to build different stuff on the secondary level so they don't feel like being at school. What we did next, after seeing all the way the American team build up their teams and work in the schools, since I don't teach in a high school in Bucharest, we tried to find a neutral place to train, and we convinced the guys from the Polytechnic University in Bucharest to give us a place. It was a huge room, much bigger than the one that we are sitting today here. We renovated the rooms with our partners, and we created a robotics hub for FTC in Bucharest. We thought of a place where the children come for fun. Uh, they feel very relaxed. They don't come to work. They come actually to learn. We have even um, a ping pong table, uh, air hockey, and food, drinks, uh, soda, and so on. So we try to make their staying very, very interesting and full of pleasure. Uh, it worked very well. Then we managed to bring the, Romanian, uh, the competition in Romania. Um, it was a challenging part. Why? After we found two of our main sponsors and the partners, McKen and Berede, um, of course, everybody wanted to do robotics for, for a lot of children. It's not easy to do this kind of stuff. Imagine in a robotics team, at least to grow it up from zero, you need to invest at least 8,000 euros in parts, 3D printers, uh, kits, uh, field, and so on. Uh, they accepted the challenge, we accepted the challenge, we brought a competition in Romania, and we managed to create 54 new teams. I think this is by far the, mo the greatest experience and legacy we will leave to Romania, because even if you win or lose the World Championship, always you ask yourself, what are, what's going to be in the future? I think these children will continue the fight. We traveled around 33 cities in Romania, by car, we presented the children at the high schools, the robots that we had last year, and they accepted the challenge. There were more than 700 students involved, and we uh, gave, I mean we, not we as a team, we as a group with the partners. Each team received a kit of parts, so they had enough parts to build the robot, to program electronics, and so on. We gave them a 3D printer plus the knowledge how to actually print, design, and create parts. And this was a novelty for Romanian high schools. They just knew 3D printing exist existed, but they never had ever touched uh, a, a part. And we gave them the field for training. Because the, um, the competition is very much designed for the American games, it's hard to receive and to bring parts from America to Romania. What are our future projects? We would like to, to continue the project with FTC that comes from First Tech Challenge in 2018. The big challenge is to travel around the world. 
Last year we had a lot of competitions. We managed to win first place in South Korea in January. Then we went to Russia. In Russia it was hell on earth because they had regional competitions before their national one, but we managed to win again. Then we went to Canada. In Canada again we had a shock because the American teams from Washington State came to compete in Canada, but we managed to beat them in the finals. <coughs> then there was Israel. Israel was the competition where we paid the most of the fees. We paid 1,000 euro competition fee. It was super outrageous. But they said, you want to come, you want to get an invitation, you need to pay for that. OK. We paid, we won again. <laughs> then we went to, to the World Championship. To the World Championship, we managed to get to the finals. And then, after the World Championship, we went to the Championship in Australia. Because their education system is shifted between summer and winter, their competition was during the winter, the summertime in our country. Again, we won first place. And now we are preparing for the new game of the next season. Also, there is another interesting competition for, um, in Romania. It's called um, the National Rovers Competition. It is designed by the Romanian uh, Space Agency. And again, uh, small teams of children, they need to design a, a rover, like a machine that has to explore different types of land. And we are also preparing the first crawler. It will be a robot that can shape shift and expand. And our biggest challenge will be to finish our summer project. We want to bring on the market the first Romanian social robot. It will be a robot of the size of a child, not very big, not very small. It will have all the elements of artificial intelligence that our colleague talked about in the first place. We did a lot of research and experiments. We managed to connect it to the Google platform. It works brilliantly. We collaborated with a team from Cluj. They managed to create a software to speak in Romanian, because it's very hard to find a software that speaks clearly Romanian. You can find English all sorts, but Romanian, it's a big challenge. And hopefully, it will work. And we want to bring it on the market until Christmas 2017. Once again, thank you for inviting us. We also would like to thank to our partners because we could not have done it alone. And I think we will inspire a lot of children to continue to, to do something differently. And hopefully, it will be a change for Romania. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting presentations. Now it's time for questions. Please. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Esther. I'm working for the IEEE. Um, I have a question. How does this competition work maybe outside of Bucharest? For example, if there is a school who would like to attend here in Iași, do you have a network around Romania or do you travel from Bucharest to reach out? Yes, thank you. Um, so, uh, we created a small network of high schools. When we designed the competition in Romania, it was quite hard because we did not know the background of each city and what the high schools have to offer regarding uh, human intelligence and actually potential. We picked up uh, high schools uh, that were mostly designed to be informatics. Um, but we also had a mix of technical high schools, so we wanted to combine the practical side and the theoretical side. We have um, a team in Yash, it's a team from the National College. Um, we could not promote several teams in each, country, in each uh, cities because we wanted to have like the map of Romania, let's say, mostly with spots everywhere. It was impossible. Uh, some of the high schools just uh, rejected the project. It said it was too complicated, although we told them they don't need to pay anything and we'll help them also in doing the stuff. And in a lot of places, it was um, an interesting experience. Why? We came, we told them about the project. A lot of even the students said, oh, they're just coming, talking. They'll never come back to actually bring the parts or do something. And then it was the shock, we came back. Not only we came back, we came back twice. We brought them everything we promised. And after, I remember, I had this situation at three high schools, mostly when, where the coaches were, um, were ladies, were teachers. 
After I left, they came running to the car and said, Mr. Pana, Mr. Pana, uh, you forgot something. And I said, what lady? You forgot to leave the instructions. What for? For the robot. And I said, no, you need to build it as you wish for. <laughs> and uh, it was a shock for Romania because they thought they would just copy a model. Uh, everybody would have the same stuff. They would simulate a participation and that's it. And I tried to, yes, and get a diploma. What's interesting, even related to diplomas, at this competition, you don't get a diploma. And we had huge discussions with um, the organizers from around the world, because we told them in the Romanian system, the children need diplomas, at least to show a proof that they did not live just for fun in a country. They left a competition, they won, and it's written on the diploma. In the only country that gave out diplomas without asking for them was Russia. The other ones, we had to beg. <laughs> And um, our project and our idea was to, to involve as many students as possible. And as I said, to have at least the vital points in Romania reflected and actually coming to the competition. So we have a team in Yash. We have six teams in Cluj. It was a shocking Cluj because uh, we thought the enthusiasm was much bigger than actually it was, but it wasn't so much. Anyway, um, we have a lot of teams in Bucharest, around seven. But as I said, 54 teams from the first year, it was a shock even for the American partners, because usually this growth rate comes in 10 years in other countries. Imagine not whole Western Europe has 42 teams, and we have in Romania 54. So it was a shock. But as I said, we tried to help them out. I think it was a success. If you want to apply or you would like to think of starting a, a team in the future, uh, you can contact us, Auto Vortex. You just go online on Facebook. You type Auto Vortex. You can find our page. You write us a message, and we'll give you more information how you can start a team and actually start doing stuff. And I think it will continue. The children were just astonished of what they managed to create from zero. And as I said, only if you do a lot of hard work and passion, you can actually have good results. And the results pay off. It's a competition where there is no subject. I mean, uh, the implication of a jury or uh, personal decisions. If the robot and the team is good, you can see it on the field. If not, you try next year. Thank you. <laughs> had two years ago, actually the first generation who, who managed to finish high school and ah. make a decision. Imagine the, the first generation of students that we started from were very modest and simple children that managed to enter the high school with grade three, four, or five. It was the situation from our city next to Bucharest, in Voluntari. What happened with those children when I met them first time, they had no idea of what to do in life. They just wanted to get a job, no university, no other education form. They just wanted to finish high school and that's it. The interesting part is that they continued uh, university in Bucharest, in Romania. They didn't leave the country yet. But the other generations, meaning the other generations when we expanded the team and we brought in um, students from more high schools in Bucharest. We even have um, a guy coming from Kalaraj. He's traveling each weekend from starting with Friday until Sunday from Kalaraj to Bucharest. And uh, the sad part is everybody wants to, to leave the country. Why, uh, even I ask myself, why does a high school student is so keen on leaving the country? After you do so many interesting things in the team, you compete, you work with high-end technological stuff, including programming, uh, they said, what should we do? If we go to the Polytechnic University, we'll get bored. We don't want to draw by hand, we want to draw by computer. We want to assemble stuff, we don't want people just to show us pictures with how we looks like. And in a way, I understand them. So 99% is leaving the country, only one of the children remained 
at the Polytechnic University at the Mechatronics Institute. I'm happy because why? All the children that finish their stage in the team, they should and they want to become mentors for the new generations. But if they leave the country, you just meet them for Christmas, for Easter, and maybe in the summertime. It's sad, but it's the reality of life in Romania. I already have a microphone. Thank you for your presentations. Um, uh, yeah, I find it very, uh, Doran, uh, I know that you organized the conference, I find it very, uh, very inspiring topics on, on, on the stage. Uh, it's nice to see. Uh, Paul, I have a question for you, um, uh, a rather practical one. How do you reach out to the teachers and do you have um, numbers already on how many are actually using your tool, which we like a lot? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's quite challenging getting to teachers, of course. Uh, we use a combination of tactics. One of them is we speak at gatherings of teachers. Another is uh, we present in the media as many times as we can what we're doing. But actually, the most effective one is when you do get a very enthusiastic teacher. Mm -hmm. And we, that happened to us a few times. Uh, one of the teachers, which is a guy from Romania, actually, he was so enthusiastic after finding out the tool and using it daily for a couple of weeks that he made a video himself of how to use it, very simple, amateur-like video, which is the best in this case. And he, he called the media also, so we were shocked to see that we were featured in Romanian media. Why? Because we're not quite necessarily directly interested in that. And we're like, and, it was this guy. So their enthusiasm is the, the one thing that works virally. Uh, otherwise, you cannot cover the world. And, and they're, of course, cold emailing. Now we, we're getting started, actually, with cold emailing teachers in several countries. They, they behave differently, so we need to make sure that we reach them uh, each and every one. So that's the kind of thing that we're, we're doing, yeah. And it's, because uh, you asked the number, it's now around 6,000 teachers and lecturers combined. Sometimes it's, it's quite hard to make, to understand because they, they all say they're from college, right? And the UK college means either high school or university. Sometimes you have to figure it out yourself. So it's not like in the US. Um, it's a bit of a problem. Okay. okay. May, I, may I ask another question? Sure. And on the long term, what is your business model? Because it's, um, yeah. it's, it's for free, right? We just signed up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, true. It is for free, and what you are seeing here will stay like that uh, from now on, uh, eternally. Um, however, what we are building now, behind the scenes, is that we are building a AI that, with a goal of understanding what makes a presentation work. Because that's one of, the, one of the big boxes when you make a presentation such as this or any other kind of presentation is you deliver something, you may feel that they understood or something, but what actually worked from your presentation? Was it that slide or the other slide who got the most likes? Did they respond to which kind of question? How many were in the, in, in the audience? How does it work with seven in the audience or 200? So these kind of, these, all these questions, they are too complicated for a human to ask and to, to, make, to get meaningful answers out of it. But in time, we will train this AI over these sets of data that are made of, of presentations, live sessions, and results of live sessions. And we will try to assess what makes a presentation actually work. I mean, there, on, on, online you can find many answers of what makes presentation work, but they are all just based on anecdotal evidence. Uh, and sometimes they are too tied to personality to make sense for everybody, right? So, and in time, we want to have this AI make recommendations while you're building your presentation. It will tell you, oh, you present this to 200, don't use a question, an open question. You, you can't face that. Or, uh, I don't know what the AI is gonna tell us, but uh, that's something that we wanna build, yeah. Thank you. If you have what in Romania? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's a bit tricky. When you, say, when you say collaboration, you normally understand an institutional collaboration, like the company Learn Forward that Bill Hypersay is working with a company or something called a school, right? That doesn't quite work like that. Uh, we, we've been in the B2B business for a while, and we know that if uh, if the headmaster comes to all the teachers and says, use this software, they will not use it, just because. Uh, so it's, you, if you do that, you actually lose teachers. So this is why we can't, 
we can't use, I can't can necessarily use the word, we collaborate with schools. Don't collaborate with schools, we collaborate with teachers directly. So whenever a teacher likes it and he tells his colleagues and so on, so it's kind of, it's a, it's a, it's a bottom top approach, not a top down. So this is why we don't have collaborations. When we, in, in the other side of our business, which is digitizing content for publishers, there, obviously, there is an institutional side to it because we are helping them go to schools directly. But that's a different kind of story. But with Hypersay, which is a tool for teachers, we go directly to teachers. And, and yes, in Romania, to, to answer your question, in Romania we have actually quite a few schools that started using it and a couple of universities. Uh, I think that the record for... Um, for how many students were in a session is held by a Romanian lecturer at the University of Babes Boyoi, for instance. So that's, it's, it's by surprise. I mean, he was very close to be, uh, the second one was the University of Catalonia. So you, you never know, it's a kind of worldwide non-competition. Uh, but uh, as it happened, it was a guy from, a uh, lecturer from the Babes Boyoi University. And we don't, well, we got to know the guy afterwards, but we didn't know beforehand, so. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Alex, one question for you. Did you know about Hypersay before? About? Hypersay. Uh, Paul's tool. Oh, no. Uh, but uh, we arrange already, I want to use the app, the software, the page, because I want feedback from students. And for many teachers, this is a problem. To have feedbacks uh, at the finish of the uh, class, to have feedbacks about quality of the information, about how they perceive the information, about uh, how they internalize the information, about how they collaborate with each other in the classroom uh, using that information. And for me, it's very useful. I will use the page. Uh, that would have been my second question, so now that's off. And then I have a, a question for Mr. Pania. Uh, my understanding is that the competition is only for um, uh, students up to the 12th grade, yeah? Um, yes, it's mostly designed for high school students, so starting with uh, ninth graders until 12th graders. Because we did not have the, the Lego competitions we told you about in Romania, we accepted even smaller students. It, uh, it was a big stress because usually uh, 12th graders don't work so nicely with 6, 7, 8th graders because they feel like oh, they're so small. And mostly our pattern of education is uh, related a lot to the interchange between big generations like 11, 12th graders and the smaller ones because personally I don't really have time to teach everybody everything and I don't know everything that needs to be taught. Um, we had a lot of uh, requests from university students because they, they were super excited of what we did there. Imagine we have the hub, um, students can come because they travel to their, um, to their courses and they take a look and it's like, wow, it's like Dexter's laboratory. You have everything you need to play with. Imagine a lot of boys coming there and they're like, oh, I wished I did that in university at least if I did not have the chance while I was a high schooler. And uh, this hurts a lot because it's just uh, a lot of years. Imagine how many uh, things you could have done in high school and then continue actually developing or just doing uh, research in university, but real quality research related to an uh, actual topic and not just to do something for the thesis and that's it. And when there were, for example, a lot of university students that came to us because we have 3D printers and smaller molecular printers, they asked us to help them with their projects. And they did like a claw for the robot, like a small hand. And for us, it was like, it was centuries ago. But for them, it was still what they thought, it's very new. And uh, it's, a big, uh, it's a big difference. And, it's always the question, well, when will this difference go away? Because otherwise Romania cannot be competitive. Imagine we had fights with big teams and they had the latest technology. If we don't keep the pace, you cannot win. And if you cannot win, the children will be demotivated, mostly in Romania, because when you come back to the country and if you don't win, everybody's asking, why didn't you win? The parents will be sad, the teachers will be sad. But if you win, everybody's happy but nobody asks you, how did you win? So it's a big pressure for me, for the children, and in three, four months, 
a child gets to maturity much, much, uh, let's say, easier and faster than it would do just by going to school and doing regular stuff. So it's high schoolers as a rule, but compared to Romania, we don't have a problem working with bigger ones like university students, but they, they should do the mentoring for the children. But since they did not pass through all the stages, even for them, it's science fiction, but it's not a big problem for us. We, we accept them. Actually, I will turn my last question into a request. Can you move this up and have students from university making teams with one condition, have their professors, university professors, being their mentors? <laughs> That's all. Like a comment, exists yeah. already. It's a competition in mechatronics with University Transylvania University, Yash Polytechnical, Cluj Polytechnical. It it is it is for a few years ago. Okay, competition in mechatronics robotics. Every year, students have a contest. I am proud that uh, Transylvania University won last year's uh, contest. So uh, I know about because okay, we use in Romania Kahoot in my university, like a quiz, Kahoot, but I believe it's more interesting, more online, more, more um, uh, uh, Kahoot like a quiz. In, yes. Kahoot is in a generation of softwares that kind of opened the market for us because they brought the idea that you can actually survey, you can ask people yes, yes, in your yes. audience. Yes, yes, That is good. Uh, Kahoot is, is fabulous. Yes. It's one of the best uh, yes, if yes. you want to do just quizzes. If you want to combine Only them quiz. with your content, I believe then we are one of the ones. System. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. And uh, anyway, I saw 4D. We try to implement 3D printing machine in libraries now. And I saw in your, you believe it's, it is soon when uh, it will be the magic moment that uh, labor market will shake hands with academic environment. Yes. Yes? Um, <laughs> I work with a team of students, uh, five students from our faculty. They are students from uh, business faculty, and uh, we work with the startup in Timisoara with oh, Symmetry. Yes, they build one of the most advanced 3D printer in the world in Timisoara, and they collaborate with the hospital, and they build a, a biotech printing, printer. Rehabilitation. They print ears on the hospital, and students from our faculty develop their business plan and they make research, uh, they study other companies, and they help Symmetry to have a very good strategy on the market. So, and I think, yes, we will yes. be a valuable okay. product. OK, thank you very much. I want to ask you something. Do you know what is written down on Google Scholar? When you search Google Scholar, what is written down? You are librarians, no? Oh, what is it? What? Yes, stand on the shoulders of giants. We have three giants here. Thank you very much.
Yeah, yeah, I need both of them. Number three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. H I J K L M I N. I think you are looking beautiful and scary. That's good. Scaring the hell out of me. Do you need me to talk more? Is this good? Okay. Should this go behind the earlobe or? It's here. Nee. Being internet. This is so sad. Everything's fine. Guck, das ist, dass die Schriftart hier rauskommt. Äh, und keine GIFs. No. Nö. Ja. Hoping that the internet doesn't bail on me. Welcome back oh, to our new start. session. Yeah. And uh, the session will be like the rest. 
the speakers uh, will present their uh, topics and then we'll take uh, the Q&A session at the end. The first speaker in this session is a blogger, a podcaster of, on educational topics and also a director of an educational non-profit organization. Ansel Maria von Sella. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I was supposed to hit the start button of this. Maybe you should turn this off? OK. Um, yes, I will be speaking about the future of education, uh, going back a few steps, because um, we are looking at something that you might consider not having every, anything to do with education at all a movie genre that was created back in the 1940s, but the history of the genre goes back a little further. But before I come to that, I would like to tell you who I am. And I am all of this with more or less success. Um, so I wrote a book that apparently nobody's interested in, uh, which you can buy on Amazon if you want to, and if you know German, that would be very nice. Um, also, concentrating on the fact that I'm a zombie scientist. Um, have you ever met a zombie scientist before? Or, I will ask the question in a different way, uh, who of you is interested in the zombie genre? Okay, yes, one, two, three. Did you see The Walking Dead? Who saw The Walking Dead? Who liked The Walking Dead? Okay, that's good. Um, so I will be speaking about zombies, and um, in order to do so, I will put on my zombie scientist suit, which is apparently covered in blood, uh, but you don't need to be afraid since the uh, zombies I dealt with are dead. So I killed all of them by decapitating them. This is the usual way to treat a zombie, as those who saw The Walking Dead might know. What's funny about this is that I don't really like to see uh, zombie movies. I'm horribly scared of uh, watching those, uh, but still I think they are um, covering lots of philosophical topics that are very decisive for our times. Uh, if, for example, you go back uh, to the 1960s, you have movies like uh, the, um, the Night of the Living Dead. Who saw The Night of the Living Dead? It's actually considered art. It's part of the um, cultural uh, inheritance of the United Nations, and they put that into a museum, so it's an art movie. And um, as just, just like any other scientist, I have a very specific view on the world, and that is, um, it's kind of weird, but maybe you are afraid of the apocalypse. Who is afraid of something bad happening to all the world, like wiping out humanity? Who, who of you is afraid of that happening? Yes, you are. Uh, have you seen any, can you elaborate on that, maybe? What are you afraid of specifically? Climate change, yes, yes, very. Um, do not despair, those of you who are afraid, do not despair, for uh, the zombie apocalypse is not going to happen because we're living right in the middle of it. Uh, this is my view on the world. We're right in the middle of a zombie apocalypse, which is why I'm wearing this suit. And I'm going to prove my point to you. I, on my way here, I caught a very beautiful example of a zombie. Zombie, stand up now, please. Yes, zombie, come up the stairs. As you can see, this zombie is mindlessly shuffling around. Like, you know, if I had a baseball bat now, I would probably just, you know, knock her on the head and make sure that she really is dead. So good, good work, zombie. Um, the zombie apocalypse that I'm going to lay out to you has not so much to do with blood and gore and eating brains, but it's more about, you know, looking at education, of course, because that is the overall topic. Mm. Zombie, please sit down. Good zombie. Uh, as you can clearly see, this zombie follows my orders without taking them into question. Um, zombie, please stand up again. Please stand up. Uh, jump. Okay. Uh, sit down again. 
So she does everything that I require her to do, which may have to do with the fact that I'm wearing this uh, coat, which is automatically kind of associated with um, maybe some, some kind of authority. Uh, we have seen that working in the Milgram experiment. Who knows the Milgram experiment? Yes, so we had a guy wearing uh, a suit like that, ordering others to uh, deliver pain to other people, and that worked perfectly fine. Um, this zombie is uh, driven by fear and instinct. If I say fear and instinct, I mean that uh, we are mostly concerned these times, these days, uh, with surviving, not maybe surviving with our lives, but surviving on, for example, stable financial grounds. Um, this is what we um, expect, or what we saw in the youth that I work with, is a very, very common theme. So young people usually are concerned with what is my future going to look like. They're not so much concerned about leading a creative life, but they're more concerned about how do I survive in terms of security, in terms of financial security also. And that is kind of hindering. So we see lots of these uh, zombies that we work with, and it's kind of fascinating. Uh, inspecting the corpses, this is the conclusion that we came to. We arrived at the conclusion that creative lives are really not what uh, these young people are striving for. Um, over the past hundred years, we have so much concentrated on cognitive education. Thus, we started to dissociate the mind from the body. And I'm returning, or I'm coming back to the same topic that we have um, been speaking about throughout this day, uh, that there's uh, a certain kind of intelligence that really, uh, they foster each other. So you have the mind and you have the body, but in our form of education, this is what comes out of it, right? We sit down the students, in a classroom setting, we put stuff in their heads, like this is math, okay? We, we take math and we put it into their heads and then we make them spit it out again when they take exams. Mm. Our way of thinking about education is happily assuming that we are learning with our minds and heads exclusively. So once we've reached the stage of entering into school, um, our bodies that we use as child, as children, are considered something inferior, something that is merely a vessel. You pointed that out, you brought the term into the discussion, is a vessel. We're carrying our brains with our bodies into classroom settings. But not, you know, for a reason, we're not going to use these bodies anymore, except for sitting down our brains in front of the teacher. And we take the myth even further. We consider, or we start to consider that everything noble, everything that is worth achieving, comes from our heads. Uh, many, many tales of the great minds of the 20th century, 19th century, work exactly like that. We have people who say, um, if I didn't have that feeble body, I would have taken my sciences steps further. I would have succeeded in, you know, discovering whatever that was, splitting atoms. Um, actually, they did that, but you know, that was sciences all over, or for for coming generations. So you had to pass on uh, the knowledge to other generations in order to make it happen. Mm. So, ah, no, wrong. I have a split screen here. This is kind of enervating. Uh, this is the mind versus body dichotomy. And um, in education, we start, or at least that's, of course, also my, my experience that we have, uh, that we're given these PowerPoint factoids that are fed to us uh, fed to us more or less on loose grounds. So you put a lot of knowledge into us and then we hope something to develop from that. Maybe something good comes from that, maybe not. We don't so much care, uh, especially if we're teachers and um, there's some curriculum that we're going to deliver. If we are through with that, uh, we're happy that we pass this on. If our students make good grades, it's even better. So, but 
You know, the shift from taking that knowledge and forming that into something beautiful, into something noble that comes from our minds and that we hope our education to reach, this is none of our concern once we have done delivering knowledge from A to B. Mm, and I'm, I'm quoting this uh, from, I don't know who, this is also um, these times of the internet, so I found a nice quote, I don't know who wrote it, and I don't care. This is uh, the age of the internet. And um, he says, it's an he, I guess. Uh, I saw his picture, and that definitely pointed to the fact that he, he is a he. Uh, yes, you wanted to see the quote, right? I don't have the quote. I, I'm just merely reading it. Um, Zombie education leads to more mindless consumption of commodities. After graduation, even, a result is consistent with greed-driven capitalism, but not with ideal-driven democracy. So this goes back to the point that I was making earlier, that um, the education that we pass on usually evokes in the students that, it's, that uh, this education is given to, uh, that they're dealing with security issues, financial issues. And once those things are secure, we think that we can start living. Maybe more or less creatively, but we're given something that we don't really know how to use. And don't get me wrong, I'm not against the um, formal education system per se. Oh, by the way, zombie, you may stand up and sit down first row again. That would be nice. Mm. In fact, I'm sympathetic to education that connects to the world of doing and making, of providing goods and services. And, but we must not allow to become, to edu education to become a consumable, something that is merely taken in by people and then um, just for the cause of exams are put out on paper uh, in order to receive good or bad grades. Uh, this is, um, by the way, I, liked, uh, I like your tool because it includes GIFs. That is like, uh, who uses GIFs in their ordinary, everyday um, way of communication? Okay, two, three people, four, five, six, okay. GIFs, they're great. So there should be no uh, presentation without a GIF in the future. Um, let me show you something that is, uh, that probably most of us share uh, since we're socialized in a formal education system. I'm going to show to you the schools that we went to. And this is what they look like. Does this look like the school that you went to, more or less? Nice, square, you know, very useful, very practical. And it's kind of sad that when we think about education or people who build the infrastructure for education, this is what they come up with. So I imagine a conversation between those architects going like this, hey Carl, you know, we're, we have uh, a mandate, a mandate for building a school. Uh, what, what should that look like? And this is what Carl comes up with. And that's a fucking disaster. Because, you know, the idea of education is probably not something, has nothing to do with building something square and, you know, useful uh, in terms of making that accessible uh, to those who, who, who should use that, bring it out into the world and make something that really changes society. Instead, we, this is for building walls. Okay, we use bricks to build walls. And let me show to you the, um, the education that is taught or that is part of a system that builds schools like that. Oh, this is what it looks like. That's a miracle. Hmm, let me think about this for a moment. So we're put into a school and then we're asked to learn something and what they put in our heads looks exactly the way the schools look. So these things are mutually dependent. I think in, in very many cases we see exactly that happening. We put students in cubicles, what gets out of it is a square head, unable to, rep, to be wrapped around new ideas. And when we look at the big companies, for example, like Google or Facebook, they're so famous for building these huge innovative spaces 
that allow their workers to harvest and foster the beauty of their ideas. And that also has to do with the architecture that we choose. And I'm pretty sure that if you ask a Google CEO how well these people are doing inside their architecture, they would probably say, hmm, most of them are not used to spaces like that because they are dropped out of school looking like this, because they went to schools looking like this. Mm. And the, the, the irony of that is we know all these things. Uh, we know that the system that we're supporting, that we're keeping up, that we have been keeping up for centuries, is not really good. It doesn't help students to get into their full potential. But we're still keeping it because getting rid of it would mean that we have to rethink other systems, and they're big, they're huge. So we have known that it doesn't make sense to bring out the children who are six years old at 7.30 in the morning, sending them straight into school and hoping that something good comes out of that. So there's extensive research about that, that that doesn't make any sense. We should have kids you know, going into schools at like 10 and then educate them until two. But we don't do that because that puts a whole system and the way we work and the way we live into question. We would have to restructure societies if we really took into account everything that we know about education. And this is a quote from 1868 it says, the object of a student's education is or ought to provide wise exercise for his or her capacities, wise direction for his or her tendencies, and through this exercise and this direction to furnish his or her mind with such knowledge as may contribute to the usefulness, the beauty, and the nobleness of his or her life. And that is a beautiful quote, and we would probably all sign that. Uh, and now compare this quote to the education systems that we are keeping, that we are fostering, that we are supporting. Maybe we have, uh, for, for example, we have these inspiring teachers, like Mr. Keating. Um, see, I'm, I'm not judging uh, everybody out there fostering the, uh, the formal school system. I'm just saying this is an overall objective uh, that we have square-headed educational forms. So what we do is, even though we know the history, uh, we keep repeating it. And uh, this is the point where I uh, get out the nuclear weapon of, of quotes, and that is Gandhi, who says, if there's one thing that we learn from history, it's that we learn nothing from history. And that is also true for the educational systems that we have out there. Um, of course, we have some project schools, some, some places that are really sparking innovative ideas and, you know, doing things differently. But overall, uh, the, the, the formal school systems, as far as I know, uh, look like little small cubics. And that makes total sense because the, these people who come out of that, um, they're leading their Lego lives. You know, you have a Lego brick, you build something out of that, and, you know, you're just stacking up, piling up things and ideas uh, that are not really innovative, but they don't need to be because two innovative things, um, they, they are threatening a system that actually this educational system should support. So this is what we come up with again and again and again for centuries. I don't want to be too daring. Maybe the approach is too drastic. Uh, do, by the way, do you know uh, from which movie this is? Shaun of the Dead. This is like one of my all-time favorites. Um, rated maybe eighth place among my top ten movies. Uh, so if you haven't seen it, maybe you should go and see it. Um, the headline reading, if the system is dead, we'll kill it. I don't know if we need to really kill the system, um, but maybe we should start considering cutting heads and arms off of that system to make it more adaptable to the needs that we have. And I um, heard a talk by a very inspiring man who said, creative 
people, we need creative people, we need creative education, not only for those who are privileged in this world, not only for academics, most of us are academics, and we're, I hope we are creative in one way or another, but we need these creative people also to take responsibility within bureaucracy, in the police, in, um, in all these uh, public services, which are usually considered something, you know, you sit people at a desk, you give them something to do, they sign off things, and once they're done, it's five o'clock, I go home. So this is, you know, this is what the system prepares us for. Um, but what can we do uh, to aid to the freedom of zombies like beautiful Anna here? Mm. So instead of shutting down the system, maybe we should concentrate on how to treat those who come out of the system. And how do we do that? And now I'm closing in on the work that we do uh, back in Germany. As Anna said in the talk earlier, uh, we are experimenting with uh, many things. And all these things, they deal with the idea that we should start resurrecting those who are dead. And those who are dead, uh, they're usually easily to identify. Um, we didn't exercise this, but the students I work with, and that is like the most shocking part, they keep coming and ask questions, ridiculous questions, like, can I go to the toilet? Why the hell are you asking me? I mean, you have a body of your own. If your body tells you you need to go to the toilet, please, please go to the toilet. They're asking me, have I done this the right way? Have I solved this task correctly? And it's not so much about being correct in things, but taking the freedom of making mistakes. But the system that we grow up in, um, that doesn't allow for that to happen. We want them to do the right thing. Mm, so we design projects that do two things. Um, first one would be um, to reintroduce mind and body in order to have a person learning as a whole. Not considering just their heads, but also their bodies. Taking into account that if you want to learn in terms of experiencing things, that you need both entities to work together. It's not going to work if you just address the head. It's, it needs to be uh, an education, it needs to be tasks, it needs to be creative uh, experiences that address both head and body in order to, to come to change. So we have this race, uh, this um, mind and body dichotomy, which when we start thinking uh, projects that we really want to overcome and reintroduce mind and body to each other again. And this is funny because um, it seems that everybody at this conference is quoting the Dead Poet Society, which among my top 10 movies is ranked, let's say, 10. Uh, the first one being, uh, and usually I don't deliver any presentations without citing that, is The Matrix. Uh, I have um, desperately trying to fix, uh, to fit The Matrix into this presentation. Mm, it didn't work out so well. So uh, I'll stick with Dead Poet Society. And maybe you can turn off the lights so we can enjoy Mr. Keating and Todd um, doing some beautiful things. Maybe I'm not showing it because I'm receiving signs here that... Uh, should I show it? Who is in favor of seeing that? Yes, okay, you all want to see that again. Okay, let's go for it then. Do we have sound? Let's put you out of your misery. I, I didn't do it. I didn't write a poem. Mr. Anderson thinks that everything inside of him is worthless. Can we have more sound? Isn't that right, Todd? And that's your worst fear. Well, I think you're wrong. I think you have something inside of you that is worth a great deal. Okay. I Todd is asked to deliver his poem. He was supposed I to write a poem as a homework, and he just admitted that he didn't do Eric. it. Yop. The rooftops of the world. 
W, W, Uncle Walt again. Now, for those of you who don't know, a yelp is a loud cry or yell. Now, Todd, I would like you to give us a demonstration of a barbaric yelp. <laughs> come on, you can't yelp sitting down. Let's go. Come on, up. Gotta get in yelping stance. <laughs> Uh, a yawp. No, not just a yawp. A barbaric yawp. Yawp. Come on, louder. Yawp. Oh, that's a mouse. Come on, louder. Yawp. Oh, good God, boy, yell like that. There it is. You see? You have a barbarian in you after all. Now, you don't get away that easy. Picture Uncle Walt up there. What does he remind you of? Don't think. Answer. Go on. A, a, a madman. What kind of madman? Well, think about it. Just answer again. A crazy man. No, oh, you can do better than that. Free up your mind. Use your imagination. Say the first thing that pops into your head, even if it's total gibberish. Go on. Uh, go on. Uh, a sweaty tooth madman. Good God, boy. There's a poet in you after all. There. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Close them. Now, describe what you see. Uh, I, I close my eyes. Yes. Uh, and this image floats beside me. A sweaty tooth madman. A sweaty tooth madman with a stare that pounds my brain. Oh, that's excellent. Now give him action. Make him do something. His hands reach out and choke me. That's wonderful, wonderful. And all the time he's mumbling. What's he mumbling? Uh, mumbling truth. Yeah, yeah. Truth like, like a blanket that always leaves your feet cold. <laughs> Forget them, forget them. Stay with the blanket. Tell me about that blanket. You, 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 you push it, stretch it. It'll never be enough. You kick at it, beat it. It'll never cover any of us. From the moment we enter crying to, to the moment we leave dying, it'll just cover your face as you wail and cry and scream. Yeah. Don't you forget this. Oh, this is beautiful. Um, see what happens here? So um, Mr. Keating gets Todd out of his chair, um, bringing back together, reintroducing mind to body, then shutting down his senses in front of the class so he doesn't, uh, so he's not, um, you know, influenced by, by those around him. And then he starts turning his body. He's, he's talking to both. He's talking to his head and using his body. And what comes out of that is a harvesting of beautiful words that form inside this, this student. And it's kind of sad that we're still quoting, you were quoting it and you were quoting it, a movie from 1989. This is like 40 years ago. So again, this resorts to the idea that I was conveying earlier that uh, even though we know how it works, we're still not doing it. This is so sad. Uh, but there uh, is a light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, you are here, obviously, and you, so that means that you're thinking about education. Um, and now this doesn't work anymore. Yes, it does. Uh, true, true education. So uh, these, I tried to, um, to sum this up in four points. True education is transformative, soul-enriching, soul-engaging, and it opens alternatives to, path, uh, to the path of living. Uh, so we're not caught in the usual ways, but we are ready to um, find new land. How do we do this? Uh, the future of education starts with disruption and crisis. So whenever people start changing their lives, uh, start changing the way they think, usually this has to do with disruption or a crisis in their lives. And Anna and I, we have been uh, working uh, together, um, drawing on that idea entirely, because this is the moment when we start getting up our asses and asking for new things. That is when the plane crashes, uh, right? So this is when you start, maybe start thinking, maybe I should change something. Maybe I should be a vegan. Maybe I should do more yoga. And uh, then we go back home and we start being a vegan and we start doing some yoga. And maybe, I don't know, three months later, we discover that this is not truly working for us. And, you know, a habit is going back to sleep again. But if a plane crashes, that causes real change. So we thought about narratives that... Um, are drawing on the idea of crisis. And we came up with a project that is called Zombieland. I mean, of course, this is kind of, you know, the, the way that uh, we're dressed today. And so it makes sense to, um, to go back there. And we had participants ranging uh, age-wise from 16 to 20. 
and um, we put them into shoes of zombies. So we had the narrative of a zombie ap apocalypse happening and asking the question, what is now that the world lays in pieces, what is the society that you would like to live in? What does that look like? What is the political system that you really want to have and live by? Um, what is freedom? Who is controlling you? as a person. Are you, are you really free to do whatever you choose to do? I mean, you choose to be a teacher. Why? Why do you choose to be a teacher? Can you choose something else? Is that within your range, the way you look at life and what you want from it? And this is, I mean, we dressed, you can't really see that because the sun is shining so brightly, which is never good for a zombie. But. Um, we put them into these situations, their minds and their bodies, to discover exactly those questions. We build exit rooms, for example. Do you know exit rooms? Yes, uh, so rooms, you're locked up inside an exit room, you have to solve a couple questions together with a team of like 10 people and try to make your way out of the room again. So this is what we did, and you know, it, again, it takes in the whole body, uh, it takes in a communication with others, and it puts yourself into relation to other people, discovering things or telling you things about yourself, the way you look at the world. And then we had another project, because I'm running out of time, I'm just flying through these uh, slides. Um, it's called Inside the Black Box. And, uh, this is, again, this is also an example of education that, you know, considers both body and mind. And we built a black box, a room that was black, and we invented artistic language together with the participants in order to give them the chance to express their ideas, to, to be free in what they do. And basically, the forms of education that we practice have to do with setting up a framework inside which the young people can express themselves. It's not so much about, you know, uh, delivering things from A to B and then making them write them down again and get grades for that, but um, becoming part of the projects, uh, expressing their fears also. Um, discovering what their bodies are actually telling them to do. Intuition. Intuition is something that we that we're hardly getting in touch with in our lives, but we need to be able to speak to ourselves and the feelings that we have towards different things in order to be able to, uh, to make decisions on not just a rational um, point of view, but also uh, considering what our feelings and emotions tell us. So the future of education, and that is the good news, is now. I mean, we've been telling, or well, we have been told that the future, future of education is now, like for 40 years. Uh, this was told to us <laughs> by, in the movie Dead Poet Society, but maybe the future of education is now. That would be so nice if we could go there and, you know, try out things together. If it may be virtual reality or hyper se, uh, or whatever that is, robotics, you know, putting robots to fight. And maybe uh, we should have some fighting uh, amongst ourselves before we put the robots to fight. Do you do that? Do you fight each other or mm, not so much? You let others fight? Okay. Anyway, maybe that's a good idea to, to stage a fight be between men first before we put robots to fight. I don't know. Uh, just, you know, being creative and um, taking into account that we're just more than minds in order not to stay zombies. Thank you very much. Do I keep this? I keep this. Thank you very much, Anselm. Now, uh, <clears throat> the next speaker, even though he doesn't know it. Oh, the next speaker? I should go. I'm not the next speaker. Uh, no. <laughs> Are there going to be any questions? No. Uh, at the end. At the end. Yes. Um, the next speaker is going to talk about uh, zombies, uh, the way he makes them alive again, or maybe the way he gets them born alive instead of zombies, because he's going to be talking about something that us as a country, I don't think we're used to. Uh, people who live in other countries like uh, Anselm and Anna, they are born in a system where financial education is embedded in the, the fabric of it. Uh, if anybody moves from Romania to another country, they are forced to adapt very quickly because if they don't do the taxes or any financial planning, they will not be able to stay in that country for very long. So um, next will be Sergio Pencho, and uh, he's uh, f uh, manager, 
development uh, partnerships from uh, the national uh, BCR. And um, he is involved in financial education, and you will never guess, from kindergarten to university. Can I have this? Sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, I am very glad to be here in Yash. It's a very nice uh, town, and I have a lot of memory here. And until uh, my presentation will be done, uh, believe me, it's very hard for me to speak about this kind of presentation, but I am uh, definitely sure in our days a zombie is dressed like me. This is kind of zombie of our, of our days. So uh, we don't have to be covered of blood or something uh, to be a zombie, but we just have to, to be in place to be a zombie. So. I will uh, forget the zombie and I will speak about financial education and also I will speak about the digital age because we are in a digital age, in a digital era and what we have to do or what we do as a BCR, uh, Romanian Commercial Bank, in Romania to increase the education, the financial education from kindergarten, from uh, children for five years to adults with a salary, with a monthly payment. So our studies, and not only our studies, claims that we are on the last place in Europe. It's okay? Let's see, because I have some numbers here. Okay, so I will prefer to be in front of the scene, but now I, has to, I have to be here. Romanians and the financial edu education in a digital age. Why? Because, like I said, first of all, we have to understand what about, what about with the financial education. It is necessary to have a financial education on our basic uh, instinct, let's say. It is okay for us to know how the money works. It is okay for us uh, to know how to uh, earn money, how to put money to work for us. It is okay for us to have this, all this knowledge about the uh, financial system, about the banking system, about everything what can improve our lives or everything can affect our lives. So I think, yes, I think it's a main and it's the most important decision what we have to what we have to make every step in our life why because at the 15 or 18 years you have to choose you will invest in your education or not it's a very important decision what you have to to make for your future in romania like you see in this slide, we are on the 124 ranks in the world. In the world and in Europe, in this slide, you see better where we are like uh, financial education, like literate, when we talk about financial education. We are on the last place. We have the lowest rank in the uh, United Europe, in the European Union. Why? Because we don't have the basic. We don't have the knowledge about the financial education. So it's very hard to speak about it. It is very hard to compress everything in 15 minutes. It's very hard to uh, tell people how important is financial education. How important is financial education every day for us? How important is financial education for our children, for our, I don't know, family, and this financial education you will find in everything. Because you want to have a house, you want to have a life, you want to have a car, you, have, you want to uh, go in the clubs, pubs, or everything. Every decision about this, it's about financial education. So in Romania, only one on five Romanians are know what is about, about financial education. One problem is exactly like this. We are also 
on the last place with 3.8% from the total budget invest in education. So it's, uh, this is the truth. This is very hard for us to understand. But this is our uh, days, this is our Romanian days. Uh, so we have to do something. We have to improve our lives. We have to do something to change our lives. We have to take smart decisions. We have to be smarter than other people. But now, as the study uh, shows, we are not. So this is first four countries in Europe and the last four countries in Europe. What do you think we have to do? What do you think necessarily and urgently to do? I think we, like Romanians, we can do this. It's easy, it's simple, and we are on the first place. Isn't it? Yeah, but it's not enough. It was a joke. Uh, it was something uh, outside of our, my, our uh, presentation, my presentation, and also our uh, BCR point of view. So what we do for, for us, for everybody, we invest in two main projects of uh, BCR. We create digital education and financial education. You will see what we do daily, what we do uh, every day, every week, every month, every year, uh, inside of our organization and also outside of our organization with our clients and non-clients. We go with uh, our digital education and financial education in the companies which are not our clients. We want to uh, be part of the education of all Romanian people. We want to be part of education, digital or financial education for everybody in Romania. Doesn't matter if we make money with them, we uh, finance them or not, or are uh, they uh, clients of other banks. So, digital education is about Digital Experts League and E-Days Roadshow. Financial education is about teachers and clients. Exactly as I said, for our colleagues and for the clients. Let's uh, take step by step. I will not be long in my presentation. So. Digital education is about experts league. We create inside our bank a league of experts, experts in digital education. They act like uh, ambassadors for our services, for our promoting all our products, promoting all, all our uh, services for clients. And they speak with all, uh, all of uh, people in Romania about the digital uh, system, application, and everything, apps, what do we want to uh, put in this digital world. We create E-Days Roadshow. E-Days Roadshow is a uh, traveling system, let's say that, uh, when we go in all our branches in Romania and we speak with our clients, we introduce them in our uh, digital world and uh, collect uh, feedback to improve our system, to improve our services, to improve our products for the clients. So, in the uh, big picture, this is our digital world. We are uh, 2,400 experts, digital experts in, the, in BCR, uh, from, uh, I think, 703,000 employees. So, we are... I don't know if you uh, see this, uh, these pictures. This is our feedback from uh, Roadshow. And the second part in uh, my speech is about financial education. It's a very important uh, aspect in this speech. It's very important for us and it's very important for us, uh, us as a bank. Because we are the first bank in Romania uh, with this kind of project and we don't speak in financial education about our products, our service, our, uh, our everything. We don't speak about that or about that. 
we speak about financial education. In our courses, we don't pronounce VCR. We don't pronounce uh, loans. We don't pronounce, uh, I don't know, uh, overdrafts, uh, credit cards, payments, bills, not just about financial education. It's about how to improve your budget. It's about how to put your money to work for you if you have the money, or how to put your money to pay your uh, your bills. It is very important for us to have the basic information about the financial education. Uh, you receive uh, some materials. I'm sorry if I don't have for everybody, but I have in my car. <laughs> After this, uh, I, I can give you uh, more than uh, than that. So this is how it looks like our materials. It's how to organize your amount of budget. You have all the tips and tricks, you have all the uh, information who can help you to have a good budget for you. Daily, weekly, monthly. Depends on you how to, to start with, uh, with this kind of uh, project. This is for the, uh, for the people who have a salary, a monthly salary, and this is a copy of the financial education for students. We have for kindergarten, uh, we have for children for four years, five years, six years, in the high school, in the, uh, for students, and also for adults. You will, you will find here all the information what you need to make a good budget for you to make your money to be on plus, to have money after your uh, uh, monthly, let's say monthly, uh, payment. So we have uh, this course in our uh, branches, in every town in Romania. We can make these courses on the headquarters of the companies, from five to 20 participants for every, uh, every I think it's uh, about two hours when it uh, occurs because I am also a financial education teacher. So, uh, till now, in one, almost two years, I had uh, at my courses from financial education, so I had, uh, I think, 400 and something people with who I speak about financial education. It's much for me, it's less. For me, because uh, it's much for me 400 and 600 uh, people in our uh, financial education courses, but try to put this 500 to 21 million. We are one, uh, 1,000 uh, teachers in BCR. We have till now more than, uh, let's see if we have this, is some feedbacks, uh, more than 300,000, I think. Uh, people in Romania are trained by us, but also 300,000 is very small when we speak about all the Romanian people, millions. Our goal is to train everybody in Romania, but first of all we have to train our colleagues. First of all we have to train uh, all the bankers in Romania, because here is the secret. You will go into a bank with a need. Do you need something? Do you need money? for something. Uh, very important for you as a client is to be trained by our colleagues. When you speak about a need, somebody in the bank has to uh, advise you, has to be with you, has to understand your problem. And together, uh, to have the answer, together sign that contract. Which one do you want to uh, put, in, uh, put in this discussion? So, this is about financial education. I told you that we, we have this project also for uh, kindergarten, we have for uh, students, and also for, for others. It is very important for us because we, in this year, we make another step forward. We create 
uh, this is some feedback from our uh, financial education uh, courses and also I put this uh, this picture here it's a course in the kindergarten and you will see why I put this picture in this presentation uh, because of that because this year we create flip flip for BCR is a drug for financial education we go in every city and we have a very good plan to do to do that for the next I, I think years from now and we speak about financial education with kinder children I don't know what we want to, to say uh, when, uh, when we speak about our kids our goal is to train them because our generation is a little bit I don't know how to say it, to not be uh, rude about me. <laughs> uh, we are far from this kind of information. We understand uh, slower than them. We are, very, uh, we are not uh, receptive to this kind of information because we have loans, we have uh, credit cards, we have, uh, we had also uh, more interaction with the bank. So they can understand the reality of a financial education. Till now we have, uh, we had, uh, I think, 5,000 uh, children on our uh, financial education uh, courses on, on FLIP and now FLIP is near the arch in Bacal, so it's uh, very easy to, uh, to reach this, uh, this, uh, this track if you want to see how it works. I want to finish with uh, this reward, but uh, this year this is last uh, year, Bank of the Year, and also the most active financial education uh, institution in 2016. So, generally speaking, speaking, this is our uh, main project. What we are doing this in Romania uh, for uh, financial education for two and a half years, and also digital uh, education for four years. Before I thank you, I, we, we are bankers, but everybody thinks we are not human, we are zombies, like we are, <laughs> my colleague said. No, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not true. We are human, we understand everything, we, we are on the, same, uh, on the same line, and we want to help, we want to help us before we help you. So it's very important for us and for you, every day when we uh, go into a branch, into a bank, just speak honestly with our colleagues. It's very important for us to understand your need and it's very important for us to help you to have the financial education, the good financial education. So, before, uh, before I thank you, I want to make a set. Set, it will be good. Yeah? I know that. It's okay to make a set with you? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Sergio. And uh, the last speaker uh, for this session. Well, um, we met last year, and uh, she passionately presented uh, lots of new ways on how to teach kids without getting them bored. So when I asked her today, what are you doing? Uh, still doing the same thing, she said, well, for sure I'm doing uh, the things that I'm doing with lots of passion, but I'm not teaching kids anymore. And I was so disappointed. I said, oh, we lost somebody who really did that very well with lots of passion. And then she told me, I'm teaching educators. I'm teaching the people that are teaching the kids. So this is Andrea Petko. This is Andrea Petko. Do you like to hear a story? Sorry. Yes. Okay. Okay. 
can hear me? I hope so. So, I would like to tell stories to you, because you know, when we said stories to our children, the stories came from our heart. Now, I, in front of you, I present the heart of one tree. You can see the tree from both sides. You can see it in, uh, from outside, from inside, and you can see his heart. Probably you don't remember from the school why this happens. I don't know if you remember from the school how a tree grows up, but this tree has a story. And we have our own story. I don't know if in your childhood your uh, fathers told you stories, but if somebody told you stories, I'm sure that uh, these stories make you happy and makes you think that maybe you know. But in, in the classroom, we stay like this, not uh, in uh, benches, not with our notebooks. Maybe you're going to remember this class better than when you stay in, in your uh, desk. And you're going to be able to put more questions, because when we put a question, you, we already remember what he talks about. And this makes me, or we, happiest. We call this uh, the beauty of nature, and I put these pictures because it's from our days. You can go in every park, here in Yash or whatever you live, to do something like this. I don't know if you're going to be ashamed to do something like this. Maybe it will going to be easier if you pick your own child or a child to do this. If you're going to see an adult doing something like that in the park, what's up, what is wrong with him? Or even this. But when we see a child in a bank doing something like this, this is normal. Maybe it's a good student. Uh, some uh, teachers are putting uh, are putting things like that because they want to uh, bring uh, passion or to bring uh, some uh, smiles on uh, children's face. But actually, this is advertising for uh, a big company. I don't know if it's evil or it's a curious guy, but I'm sure that this will not going to work in the school. In most of the schools, if we have science centers in our classes, the, we're going to have uh, this sheet of paper on the wall. This is the science center. And after that, I don't know if we're going to have more. But if we have more, uh, sorry, you don't you can see it. Uh, the more is something like that. It's a, a place where we put a lot of stuff that we think that are related with science or something like this one, the science center, and we think it's beauty, it's a beautiful place, we can uh, uh, go there, bring uh, all the stuff. We can have a thematic area in a nice school, in a private school, maybe. Or something like that, in a good private school in Bucharest, we can have something like that. But if this, doesn't, if this is not linked with a pleasure, Nothing is going to go. Because if this kind of pictures make me feel scared, I cannot uh, learn. If this kind of pictures make me feel uh, um, in uh, heaven, I will going to start to learn easier. And this is going to bring me back to my childhood. When my brain starts to feel better, I'm more prepared to learn. And this is what we uh, did uh, till last year. We uh, tried to make uh, a wonderful um, experience in um, museums in Bucharest to bring uh, children together, to bring staff from the museums, to make museums alive, because we thought that 
children's can learn more. And we did this in the science centers in Bucharest, but also in the, on the MAPS uh, museums in Bucharest. Because if, people, if uh, children are sitting like, the, like in these pictures or like this, they can learn more. They can learn about magnetism, about uh, everything. But how many children I can teach? You know, well, my previous colleague presented you how many children uh, BSR can teach? Few hundreds. Maybe with all of your uh, uh, colleagues, few thousands. This is what we realized. In our museums, even in our university, we cannot teach too many people, too many children. But if we go further, and we bring their teachers, their daily teachers, this is going to make the difference. And if last year we just um, make a pilot with uh, uh, something around 100 uh, teachers to see if they are able to, um, to do their class, uh, to do the same thing in their class, in the daily class, uh, this year we, uh, we had at the beginning 600 uh, teachers, and after that, another 700. And this makes us seeing, during the summer, more than uh, uh, 3,800 uh, children. And we had one uh, big uh, training here in Yash, and in uh, uh, 10... Uh, uh, cities around uh, Romania. You cannot see uh, pictures from those trainings, but I can tell you that uh, they were so enthusiastic. And what we uh, realized in the time, that if the, the public actors, mayors, um, guys from the uh, uh, inspector as the coordinator of the teachers are involved, uh, Maybe sometimes they think, uh, as you uh, said in the previous session, this came uh, from my uh, supervisor, from my boss. I disagreed. But if they, if it, even if they came because their boss told them to, to come to the training, because he told them, if you don't want to, do, to be a volunteer teacher, don't be. Because he said that, this, actually we had at the end another 700 teachers, even if at the beginning we trained just 600. So uh, this was a really good story. And what we do now, we go in uh, collegiums, in kindergartens, in, uh, even I'm uh, teaching even uh, students, that if we do things together, here we are with uh, many, uh, uh, with few, uh, teachers from schools and kindergarten in uh, Prahova County. We train them how to teach science. Do you know that in the public schools in Romania, if you want to be a teacher in the primary or kindergarten, nobody teaches you science till you have 16, after 16. But after that, you need to teach uh, things about electronics, about uh, magnetism, about germination. But nobody teaches you this after 16. And what else? We teach them to teach with joy and to teach together with uh, parents. How we do this? We tell a beautiful story. We bring a book or a piece of wood, doesn't matter, and we tell them a story. After that, we present, of course, the science content, because without the content, we don't teach anything. Um, and every time, we do experiments. The experiments can be just something simple like this, just observe, but can be also some chemistry or physics, whatever. And at the end, we need to play. Because when we play, our head is relaxed, and we can fix the information. Um, I will going to show you just a short example, starting with the 
most uh, know, well know around the world the book, which is uh, the uh, grippy uh, caterpillar. Uh, maybe you saw it in your childhood also. Um, we put in front of children all the materials, all the stuff that you're going to use during the experiment. We uh, read the book. We ask them just to draw a leaf. This is a really simple thing. To observe the leaf and to draw the leaf. And you're going to see that they draw the leaf exactly how they print the leaf on the uh, earth, on, on the clay. Um, and after that, we uh, bring all the materials and we analyze and we speak with them. Why you draw it like this? What did you observe? Um, because when we go upper with the same book to bigger children, children to bigger uh, to the high school, we need to uh, shape uh, to design a full uh, experiment. And we, with the same book, we did different experiments for different ages. When the children say, OK, I know this uh, novel. Ah, what are you going to do now? I know it. You read it to my uh, uh, brothers. What are you going to do now? And you show them another experiment. But their uh, brain is already relaxed. Uh, but we do the same with mathematics, with blocks. And we go out. Because the children like to go out of their classrooms. Um, and we show them everything that can be touched. Because it's wonderful to use uh, internet, to use uh, e-learning and so on. But if we like to touch. And I will going to invite you to touch this uh, piece of food in the, um, um, after we uh, finish our presentation, and to fill it, and maybe to use this uh, simple tool. Um, these are some uh, pictures from kindergartens with what we did during this summer, um, just to show you how simple it can be. And it can be all around this country, from Maramureș to Constanța to Timișoara, whatever. And I, um, I finished this saying that this place really exists in Romania, in the north of Romania, in Pasul Tihuța, near to Dracula uh, Hotel. It's called uh, Tășuleasa Social. And you can go over there with your family. You can do one... Um, um, uh, I don't know, in English. A training for uh, your uh, employees over there. It will be, it's a pedagogical um, forest, and you can uh, have your own experience over there. It's a wonderful place. Thank you. Uh, I would like to invite uh, the, the speakers on, on the stage, and uh, if there are any questions, please, from, uh, from the public. I know it's lunch in a few minutes, and I don't want uh, them or uh, me to uh, stay between uh, you and the lunch. Uh, but I'm curious on, uh, on one thing, uh, and I would like to ask Andrea. If we go to Tosulasa for team building, are we going to do that with Tibi Ushieru? If we're going to go to Tosulasa uh, for a training, are we going to do that with Tibi Ushieru? I don't know if you know who Tibi Ushieru is. He is a Romanian who won two times the toughest marathon uh, at the North Pole uh, at minus 20, which is the warmest, to run for about 556 kilometers. Actually, you're going to meet his brother because his brother built the Tashlasa Social. Okay, Alin so that's a relief. So <laughs> you don't have to but train you're with, gonna the, meet, you're gonna meet with, him also. with Tibi. Okay, that's good. Now, um, are there any questions? Yeah. 
Um, so I would have first a question for you and then a question for, for you. Um, the question for you would be, as we are getting into the, a little bit into the uncharted territories of a jobless world, in a world in which through automation and stuff like that, we will need less and less humans to, act, to work. So that's a pretty weird place that we're going to be. Uh, how do you expect, how do you, if you share this vision of the future of the, of the world, how do you expect education to change in that context? Because obviously, you will no longer need to necessarily need to teach them very practical stuff because you will not need them in the factories as one or so many, many things will change but do you have any ideas or or how do you see the world how do you see education being changed in a world where your labor will no longer be needed by the society directly you're talking about my extinction <laughs> right well, it, about the teacher's extinction well, at the end. You, you like apocalypse so yeah um, the apocalypse that's nice um, there's lots of ideas and um, plans of what we are going to do in the in the future and I think we're right on the verge where there is a paradigm shift in, in education I mean you said it yourself uh, in the future we're going to have less teachers but more moderators of processes um, who are teaching children for students, um, not so much what the world looks like, but the way how they can approach the world outside. And um, the digital times are certainly part of that. And uh, there's quite a challenge for everybody who comes from, again, from that formal um, education system that makes or forms teachers. Uh, so we need to go back to university and look at the way we're educated there and um, how we're taught to teach others. And um, I guess we're not doing a great job right now. We're not acknowledging the fact that uh, we're already living in changing times, um, but that we are, um, we're neglecting it some, somehow. And, uh, mm, so far, I know from, from Germany, I, I know a couple of teachers, I don't know, maybe 200, 300, who organize themselves on the internet thinking about how they could structure that change. And that also has to do, again, with the architecture that we think, um, taking away those walls, those four walls that we're so used to uh, for classroom setting, opening up, maybe going outside, you know, um, like establishing new connections between the things that we learn and the way how we are perceiving and learning them. Thanks. And the question for you would be, um, if you're teaching kids today about uh, financial security or education, uh, do you also talk about cryptocurrencies and blockchains? Because these are, for us, it's a discussion, a daily discussion. For them, will probably be that their, fu their future will be uh, into these kind of systems. Is it part of the course or not? Uh, in the course, we try to have the basic, the, the basic information in a financial education. But definitely in every course, in every, uh, I don't know, company or in our uh, branches, we speak about this because it's the first question. When we speak about financial education, everybody says, stop. <laughs> let's uh, let's talk half an hour for the uh, for the present and uh, for the future. What what will be in the uh, in the future? We are not uh, neither Nostradamus neither Mama Omida, so we just can speak clearly with the statistics and uh, with what we have on us as information or as uh, I don't know numbers. But definitely in every course, in every uh, uh, speech, in every uh, meeting, we, we speak about that. We speak about uh, Robor, we speak about Euribor, we speak about Daya, we speak about everything uh, what is involved in a financial uh, decision. Let's say decision because uh, to sign a credit with a bank is a very important decision. So when you, when you go in a bank, you it's, it's very important to know everything about robore, uribor, daie, contract, loan, uh, overdraft, credit cards, and, uh, and everything. So, yes. Any other questions? I 
And um, I'm adding to that because we only, uh, two weeks ago, we had a project about work 4.0 and how, uh, how the, the fields are, are changing, the, the workplaces are changing. And I think once, we, uh, once we're ready to have like, machines taking over the things that we, are not really, that we don't really need to do, um, even as teachers, so for example, teaching how to calculate, easy stuff, four plus four, and then we say, okay, the key to that, to learning that is doing it repetition, doing it over and over again. So we don't need to have well-paid teachers, well-educated teachers to, to observe that and to make sure that this is going to work, but maybe we can then turn while machines are taking over or artificial intelligence, we have more room to dedicate ourselves to personal development questions, to maybe financial education is part of that. Uh, I, I never, I, I was never taught how to deal with money. So this was not part of my education. Now looking at, at myself and the life I'm leading, I, I'm saying, okay, maybe that would have been a good idea. So maybe we can then once machines take the stuff that we don't really need to do from us, then we can start um, dedicating our lives to, you know, going into deeper uh, stuff with the students that might be more helpful in the future. Acknowledging who they are, what is freedom, what are the choices I'm going to make, the life that I want to live, all that. One last question, if there's anything. Uh, you said at uh, one point that um, you involve the parents also in the plays and uh, experiments. I am curious about their attitude and how they um, um, engage in, in these experiments, if they are open or a little, I don't know, scary to be a child. A child is a child. <laughs> so uh, they learn to be scared. They are not scared at the beginning. So if we don't teach them to be scared, they're not going to be scared. So uh, what, I, what I saw in the last 10 years, uh, if a child starts to be uh, open to the science, especially for mathematics, physics, chemistry, and so on, uh, from uh, the early childhood, from the kindergarten, when they arrive to the six, seven degrees, they say, I love chemistry. You know, it was so interesting to have uh, such a wonderful uh, topics on the physics. If nobody told them that this can be fun, they were going to be scared. Oh, sh we have maths. You remember in our childhood when uh, our uh, teachers from physics came up and said, uh, a white, paper, white uh, sheet of paper, please? And everybody was scared. And after I said, okay, today we're going to do an experiment with the white sheet of paper. <laughs> it's the same now. Thank you. Um, you asked actually um, uh, another my question. My, my uh, question was about the parents. You said in your program the parents are involved. Yes. So how, so how At the beginning, the partners, especially the inspectorates, the uh, educational inspectorates, they were somehow skeptical because they say, science to the kindergarten? What this can mean? You know, it's somehow dangerous to do science in the kindergarten. You should pay attention to all the risks. Um, and we invite them to the class. They, uh, they were so involved in the experiments that, for example, in uh, Bistrița, Nasaud, in the county, they uh, said at the end, uh, the next uh, scholar, uh, school year will going to be the science year for the kindergartens and the primary schools. And we was back in the Bistrița now uh, in the fall, and we did the uh, trainings for all the primary and uh, kindergarten coordinators, not uh, directors, coordinators is another thing. Uh, because we think that if those uh, 120 uh, ladies, they are going to go in their areas and they are going to teach another, other uh, teachers, then they are going to arrive to the kids. But this was, this was happens because uh, the inspector was fully involved. Thank you. Because they did the experiments. This was uh, the the things that uh, change their minds.
Well, thank you very much, and please have a last round of applause for our speakers of these sessions. And uh, I invite you to have lunch, and we will be back at 2.30. Thank you.